he's destined to get knocked out by Jake Paul. She's destined to film it. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. The pressure on Caitlin Clark, Perloff, it is mounting. Hey, welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. Listen, this is a phenomenal story. We're talking about the women's bracket as much as the men's bracket, Perloff. But to say that Caitlin Clark is not the singular college basketball player, male or female, who is facing the most pressure in this tournament would be... Uh, oblivious. That means you're just not paying attention. I don't care about Zach Eady. I don't care about any of these guys on the men's side. Caitlin Clark is the number one star of March Madness, yeah. and she is facing the most pressure. She is the one who has to live up to whatever this billing is. Now, is it winning a national title? Obviously, that becomes you know like a movie script if she wins. Uh, if she wins the title, however. You cannot deny that if you are going to put one person who says who needs to win the most, she is absolutely the person who needs to win the most. Oh, no way. South Carolina is the heavy, heavy favorite. They're undefeated. They have way more pressure than her. They've already won. Dawn Staley has already won a national title. No... But no one really expects Iowa to win this, do they? If they do, they're they're not watching. Well, they're I watch on Saturday. Seed. I know they're. I think they're number two in the odds. But I watched on Saturday when they played Nebraska and they basically face guarded Caitlin Clark and he started at zero for nine in the first half from three. There's no way that that team is in the same realm as South Carolina. South Carolina is way better. Okay, I'm talking about not just Caitlin. Listen, if the team was really, if it was just Caitlin and the Caitlinettes and it was really just the one-person show. It is. Well, But they're not getting a one seed. You still have to mm. win, and they're, in, and they're in the Big Ten, so it's not like they're coming from some weak conference here. They've always had trouble with Nebraska. They've had a little trouble with Ohio State. So there is talent in the Big Ten. And you don't get a one seed unless you legitimately have a chance to win the title. To say that they don't is kind of, um, it's, it's actually a backhanded like compliment, I, if you will. I don't think they have a chance. And I, I think South Carolina will blow them away if they get them again. I think it was amazing that they beat them last year. I, I understand this, but... Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I don't think there's real pressure to win at all. Now, unless you're talking about pressure to show up and win a bunch of games, like define your terms here. Do you mean that she has to at least get to the final four and then she's fine, or she has to win it all? Because you can't possibly say there's pressure on her to win it all. Look at Iowa. They're just not as talented, and they're not as big as these other teams. They got to the championship game last year. It's like they, this is no longer a classic. They're the David to the Goliaths here. They're a Goliath. She's Goliath. And they say nobody roots for Goliath. I don't think that's true. People are rooting for Caitlin Clark. But I, there's two things. Uh Pressure to win, number one, mm-hmm. and complete this sort of mission. Yes, would it be a little st- storybook? Yes, but I don't want to change the expectations for Iowa just because South Carolina is having such a good year. They were having a great yeah. year last year. LSU was having a great year last year, and Iowa was right in the mix, right there in the final game, and pulled uh, did pull the upset uh, on South Carolina. I also think... So there's team-wide, and there's definitely pressure on Caitlin Clark to win. And I think there's more pressure on her personally, like what's at stake. And here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about she has our national attention right now. And she is benefiting because of her hard work and how exciting she is and how captivating she is in every moment of this. But she is like an NIL dream. Right, she's got sponsorships from State Farm, from Gatorade, from Nike, from Buick, from a place called Hy V that I've never heard of before. H and R Block, Tops. I'm going to tell you, yeah. I'm not sure that all these go away, but these brands want to be associated with a winner and with someone like Caitlyn. If she flames out, let's just say, heaven forbid, they go out in like the second round or yeah. something, then I think that the national attention moves away from her at a time when she's going into the WNBA, which, yes, the ratings are going up in the WNBA, but it's not nearly where, you know, women's college basketball is right now. But she's already become the biggest star in probably the history of the sport without winning anything. So why, what's going to change? I think that that people people will turn away. I think that if it's, if it's not, if it, it, let's just say not on the final four, if this really ends with like a, just, um, you know, flat, and they somehow get upset, which I know it's a lot harder to pull upsets in the women's tournament than it is in the men's tournament. We don't see the, you know, crazy bracket busting on the women's side generally. But if she somehow ends with like just a squeak here or, or something happens and they go out quickly, 
I think that people turn their attention away from her, and I think that it's going to be hard to get it back in the WNBA yeah. because they're just simply not the audience. The casuals, the you know, the men, for example, like ma- male sports fans, I just don't think they're inclined to watch the WNBA as much as they are to watch women's college hoops because of how much we love college sports. So I think her moment here could not be bigger. Yeah, I think obviously a second round exit would be terrible. Right. But she already she built her superstar long before any tournaments. I mean, she was probably the biggest star in the sport as a sophomore, and they didn't, weren't winning anything because they're not that good. They're Iowa. When's the last time they made a Final Four before last year? What? I think the last time they had a one seed, I thought was like ninety two or something. Yeah, like it's that. been they're they're not a powerhouse. I think uh, she is. A lot, you don't have to win it all to become a huge college superstar. I've been looking at some all-time lists. The person she beat on the all-time men's list, Pete Maravich, right. is considered a top five all-time college player, and they didn't even win anything. Right. And I was thinking about, do you have to win the title, like Christian Leitner, to get this? Probably. But Larry Bird made every SI cover, and he never won. He kept on losing to Magic Johnson. Uh not to go two white players to compare it to, right. but you don't have to win the well, title. Steph Curry. Steph Curry got yeah, a yeah. huge bump, yeah. but he was different. It was like small school. Uh, yeah. um, Michael Jordan entered his junior year as the biggest star in the sport and didn't win. It didn't affect his legacy at all. Well, Jordan, I, did, Jordan, did, Jordan win. did win, though. Did well, no, I know. He was shot. a role player on his freshman team, but nobody was disappointed. That, they were a little disappointed at the time, but it didn't affect his star power. He came in the league as the most marketable star of all time, even though they were kind of disappointing uh, as a junior year. Uh, I don't think her marketing goes down at all if they lose because she's already built this incredible marketing empire without any championship. No, I get it, but I'm just saying she's at a crossroads here where we're not exactly sure how many of the eyeballs are going to follow her to the WNBA. We think a lot. I think I think there'll be definitely more. I think the ratings will continue to go up for the W, and that's great. And, you know, they are still... They're in, like, what, their 25th year? It's not like they're the sports league that's been around for 100 years. So they're still going and growing and all of that, and, and I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying we don't even know if the eyeballs are really going to translate from Iowa to the WNBA. So she can't afford to have this meek exit from this tournament. Winning it all is on one side. Okay, yeah. maybe that's going to be impossible, and, and, and a valiant effort in the Final Four might be enough. But any kind of meek exit from this tournament – I think would be devastating to her and to her star power. Because again, we are a uh, attention, like the attention span of this country and especially with sports feels like it's, it's a blink of an eye. And if you don't capitalize on your opportunities, I think people end up tuning away from you and they'll turn to the next thing. We'll go to Juju. We'll go to the next women's college star who now can hit from the logo. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I think she's going to be fine. I think she's such a big star that whatever happens in this tournament, she's still going to be a big star. We saw yesterday a docu series featuring her and some other players is coming out yeah. in May. There, I'm telling you right now, if you're betting, do not bet on Iowa to beat South Carolina this year. Well, South Carolina <laughs> is uh, this. This might be one of the best teams we've seen. I honestly think Iowa. If you take out, I, I really want to see this tournament teams are going to be prepared for them this yeah. year. And if you take out Caitlin Clark, I want to see the rest of that team win. So I, I think people are going to watch the game that she's in and realize, oh, you know what? They're they're not as good a team as some of these other elite teams. And I don't think they're going to kill her for it. And she's built all this before, you know, she was so popular. They hadn't won anything coming into last year's tournament. And all the buzz was about her. Everybody wanted to see Caitlin Clark because of her style of play. And that's not going to change win or lose. I, I think she's still going to be the biggest star in the sport no matter what happens. Wow. I, I'd love to know what you guys think. 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. They can't afford to fizzle here, especially her. I, I don't want to put more pressure on her because it's coming from all angles, but she is the number one. If you're going to rank the stars of the tournament, both men's and women's, and you put a top five or a top ten, she's one. You can say it's debatable. It's not. You think Zach yeah. Eady is the same kind of intrigue or eyeballs? Nobody cares. Right. I think the women's tournament will suffer tremendously if she leaves, but I think she's fine. See, I'm not so sure, again, because I think that you and I could sit here and, and we could have a serious conversation about whether her stardom is going to truly follow her to the yeah. WNBA. So if you don't have at least the launch point of your finishing your college career – On a high, whatever that means, Final Four national champion, uh, runner-up national champion, at least that, then Mm. I I, I don't – it's like you're going off the diving board, and instead of doing this big, fancy dive, you end up doing a belly flop. I mean, I think the launch point happened 
long time ago. She's in, she's already in orbit. Uh, and I don't think she crashes. Maybe if she goes one for 12 and they lose in the second round. But I, first of all, I don't think that that's going to happen. Second of all, I think it's, it's way too late. The spaceship is less a station. And Caitlin Clark, she's <laughs> going to be origin, so... Blue Origin, her and Strayhead. And she's going to be the most popular WNBA player we've ever seen because we've never... There's never been hype for somebody to come in the WNBA like this. I don't think it matters what happens in this tournament. I think she's already there. Uh, you know, obviously, I think social media and go way back when Steph and LeBron were tweeting about her as a sophomore. I, I just think there's so much going on with Caitlin Clark that it hasn't been defined by tournament. They did not win the tournament last year, and yeah. she was she came back this year and like, oh my god, there's so much hype. So I, I think she's fine. Yeah, but that national championship game helped. The final it, oh, four it, definitely it, helped. It that, definitely, it definitely that helped. Was huge and like her and Angel. And that helped too. It was a close game. All of it helped. It wasn't actually wasn't it a twenty point game. Was it's, it? 20 yeah, I, I, but no, regardless, that game was not close. The was South Carolina game, South Carolina <laughs> game, they won was close. Thank yeah, you. and that to me, uh, that was again that was such an upset. I think it, I looked it up last night. That was an eleven and a half point spread, South Carolina, and I don't think South Carolina is going to let that happen again. I think they've been circling this date and praying that Caitlin Clark gets to them in the finals. And I think there are a lot of teams like that. She's got this target on her back because of the size of her stardom, and I don't think it's going anywhere. Uh, in second round, even a second round loss, I, I will stick with this. I think she's the sports biggest star, and she's going to be next year. You don't tell me you're not going to be curious about WNBA next year. Not you, but yeah. general casual fans are still going to be curious about what she's going to be in pros. Can it translate? She's the all time leading scorer in the sport in both men's and women. That's that alone. I yeah. think that record is the thing, not yeah. necessarily the tournament success. I think there's like two conversations, right? It's like her stardom, but I also think that it's not as easy as what Larry Bird did going from college basketball into the NBA. And I know the NBA wasn't what it was then that it is now, but I still think there is a little bit of a barrier of getting people who are college basketball fans to watch the WNBA. Yeah. You've always talked about you hate that it's in the yeah. summer, you know, whether it's because when the games are on yeah. or whatever it is, I just, I, I think that if she fizzles again, I just don't think you have that big hype. I, I get it to, where you're going to have all the people who have been watching, who have been following, who are invested in her, are going to all of a sudden say, all right, I got to be catching every Indiana Fever game. Yeah, I think she is going to be something the WNBA has never seen. One way or the other, it is, I, I'm not saying it's going to catch the NBA, but obviously, no. and you know what, I say that, I'm not totally sure, because the NBA ratings are not doing great. Well, you, a few actually, WNBA to be games, fair, some of the college games have already passed the WNBA in terms of ratings. <laughs> yeah, I think, rating. I think she, all, all the hype, and you know, I've said this before too, I don't think it's just Caitlin Clark, I think America was ready for women's college basketball to take a step up, because Paige Beckers was getting a ton of hype That's true. Bef Sabrina. before she got hurt. Um, I think Caitlin and Paige have uh, gotten more hype, just social media and everything. And yeah. I think to Steph and LeBron's credit, like the men's game has really lifted them up too yeah, and appreciated them. So I, I think that we're going to see the people behind Caitlin are going to be bigger stars. I think Juju's going to be a huge star. Yep. So it's all good. I think Caitlin come WNBA is going to be, my, it's going to be so interesting and it's going to be a massive headline. I was reading an article on Forbes. We're talking about Caitlin Clark and how much pressure is on her in this tournament. She's facing more pressure. You'll agree with me on that than any player men's or women's you could say Purdue because they lost last year to Fairleigh Dickinson I don't think anyone actually cares if Purdue avenges that yeah. loss I do not think Zach Eady and Purdue has not really grabbed on with the public I don't think in a way not close to what Caitlin has done. yeah there's definitely no player but I do think South Carolina has some pressure well that's okay that's yeah. true because they're undefeated and there's always a more on an undefeated season yeah. but again i was reading an article in forbes yesterday that caitlin clark is going to have more commercials than any other yeah. player in march madness you can't have all the commercials this is like you know we talk about this with justin herbert you can't be in the subway commercial and then be this flop i don't think he's been a flop but you and then not live up to expectations it's like if you're going to get all the attention and all the commercials there's just no other choice. Like you have to deliver in this tournament. Yeah, I mean, if you want people to keep believing in you. I think you need. If they get three wins, they're fine. That's plenty. I don't think so. So, oh my gosh, three wins. They're a one that's seed. An elite eight <laughs> appearance in that sense. They yeah, get the I first mean, two games at home. Like those should be givens. Yeah, I mean, but watch the spreads as they get deep into the tournament. They're not going to be. You're going to have South Carolina favored by fourteen, and you're going to have Iowa favored by seven. I just. I mean, come on. If you watch that team, they're just not as big and fast as those SEC teams. They made it to the title game last year. 
I know, and it was crazy. <laughs> two seat, how crazy was it though? I don't know. They, I don't want to change like, the like expectation. Six or seven seat yeah. that like where the little engine that could. That you guys bet on Iowa. Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe Put, we throw will. down that bet. I'm telling you that she's got to deliver here. Am I off base? No, I, I think that to me, I think one we forget how unforgiving. You know, social media and the internet and basketball fans as a whole are for Ask John who, Collins for people who that actually poor dude. <laughs> right people who lose Got dunked on last in, night. in big moments. And number two, I just don't think that there's ever been a star this big pearl off where you could say if they don't win a championship, it doesn't matter. Like I, I I'm sorry, like I can't. I'm trying to think of other stars. Yeah, but as she's she's pl- uh, ascended to the top of the sport without winning a championship in a way we've never seen. So explain that. Oh, she's in rare air. She's well, a new territory. Well, yeah, because she's had individual success. But, right, and that's but, what but, I but think. We, but we expect in, when, when we talk about the greatest of all times, is what the, that, that's the air that Caitlin's been ascended to. We associate that with also winning championships. We say basketball's a team sport, but nobody just nobody treats it that way. Like we got to be realistic. Well, yeah, so, but I think there's a realistic like Maya Moore, who you know, name your UConn star. They had three All Americans around them. Name a t- you know name a teammate of Caitlin Clark. Name no, an All American around her. There's not going to be that kind of nuance when you talk about casual fans who a lot of them are not watching Caitlin Clark residency regular season games. I think that's another thing too. I think you're saying well everybody knows I was not that good. I don't. Think I think they no, do. I think no, they do. Uh, Pearl EJ. Off, no, you cannot say Pearl off that at one at the one point when it comes to the NCAA men's tournament that nobody's paying attention and nobody watched the regular season games, but that everybody knows that I was state. I mean the Iowa Hawkeye depth chart. Like there's, there's like that's not the case at all. I think people know that she's a star. I think they know that she's the best player, but they see a number one next to their, their team name. They see a team that's been ranked in the top four or five all season. They say, all right, well, there's an expectation that they go really far in the tournament. They have the best player. I, I think there is a knowledge that Iowa is not a, a traditional powerhouse. I, I do think, I understand what you're that, saying. I'll give you, I'll give you. Okay. Yeah. That I, yes. And also, yes. too, it's not I, just. I, a, and I agree with that, too. Yes. And also, <laughs> it's, it's Iowa, too. That translates to all Iowa programs. Iowa football is this little plucky, unusual team. I just think everyone, you don't think college basketball, you think UConn, you think Tennessee, you think now South Carolina. I think fans are savvy enough to know that, and the individual stuff that sends that. I mean, it's just a difference of, of opinion. Yeah. I think she's going to be fine if she loses, and I think she's going to lose. By the way, Maya Moore, I mean, for example, the UConn, Maya Moore, she played with Tina Charles, Renee Montgomery, uh, where we're on her team. I mean, I do think there's a, in college, women's college basketball history, there's these super teams. Isn't that a sport that's always had all the talent kind of uh, glommed up at the but top? top at the and it's time, like yeah. that in the WNBA right now also. Yeah. But at the same time, this is probably the era of college, women's college basketball that is, has the most parity. So if Caitlin mm. Clark's going to play in an era where you have the most parity, we have the most teams that can compete for a national championship. LSU, we talked about how great they were last year. They were a three seed, and they won a national championship. So it's not like they were this undefeated team that was blowing everybody out and that they were unstoppable. Like, they were a three seed, and they won. So it, it, you're, you're playing in the, in the era with the most parity, and you would never won a title even though you were by far the best player. I, I, I'm not saying that it's fair, but right. I, I think it's, for me, it's, it would be naive for me, naive for me to think that she's not going to have some kind of blowback if they come up short, especially if they come up short in a Sweet 16, I think even in an Elite 8 situation. 855-212-4CBS. I like the line where you said it's a team sport, but it's not treated like that. Basketball, yeah. that is. And that's a men's side, women's side, NBA, college. Yeah. It's like and we expect if you have a great player, it's going to be one on five. And also the coach, too. Obviously, Kim Mulkey had won titles before LSU. I think yeah. that's a big factor. I mean, there's how many uh, title-winning coaches are there in college basketball? Not a lot. Because Gino sucked them all up. <laughs> <laughs> and it was yeah. Pat Summit before that, right? 855-212-4CBS. 855 855-212-4227. You're welcome to weigh in the pressure on Caitlin Clark. And if they fizzle in this tournament, does that hurt her stardom? And whatever's next for her with the WNBA, are you going to be more likely to watch, less likely to watch? You kind of say, oh, that was a great story in college. I'm kind of done with that story now and not follow her stardom to the WNBA. want to hear from you. Got a lot to do here today. I'm looking at this rundown. How are we going to get this all in is a question. Today, we will do several things. You are still welcome to join our bracket challenge. This is our pal, Nick in Texas, who runs our unofficial Facebook page, is running our official Maggie and Pearl off bracket. (laughs) Official air quotes. Uh, You can go to CBS Sports. It's called Pearl Jam, P-E-R-L, off of Pearl off. Pearl Jam, season three. Go sign up. Uh, say you you beat me and Pearl off in a bracket challenge, because you probably will. So CBS Sports radio YouTube channel? Uh, yeah. You can find the link yeah. there. You okay. can find the link on our social handles. 
Um, and the bracket is through CBSSports.com website. So you go there, search oh, okay. out you Pearl can get, Jam. Oh, you can do it season. on the CBS Sport. Okay. There you go. So uh, we got that for you. I think my kids are old enough now that they they better deliver. <laughs> 12 and 13. <laughs> oh, no this more, is perfect. No more, oh, that's cute. I am going to have bragging rights in my household at least <laughs> this year. I might lose this bracket, but I'm not going to let my wife beat me for a third year in a row. That's not happening, Maggie. <laughs> I believe in Sarah. Uh, and then also today, the Maggie and Perloff March Madness bracket, we are doing one hit wonders as our non-sports March Madness bracket. We will reveal the second region, the last call region will come your way in just about an hour. We did the weddings region yesterday. It was a smash hit. Today, we do the last call region. So join us for that. 855-212-4CBS. Get the conversation going about Caitlin Clark and the pressure on her. Let us know what you think. It's Maggie and Perloff, CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining.
45 seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. All right, back on Maggie and Perloff. Big debate here. Does Caitlin Clark need to win big time in this NCAA tournament to keep her rising star rising? I say the fact that she's such an individual star, the all-time leading scorer in college basketball history, means so much more. And honestly, I'm telling you right now, Iowa is not winning this thing. And you can cut that right now. The entire field is geared up to single-handedly face guard Caitlin Clark all over the court. Someone's going to bring them down. South Carolina, gigantic favorite to win this tournament. If South Carolina gets Iowa, they have been thinking about nothing but vengeance for a year. So it's going to be South Carolina, but I don't think this is going to slow down Caitlin Clark's rise. I think she's such such a big star. She is a big star, but I think she's got so much at stake here. If they fizzle out in this tournament, if they don't even get to the Final Four, if they don't get to the championship game after they got there last year, I just do not think that the... It just ends with such a whimper that okay. I don't think a lot of people are going to follow her to the WNBA. They're oh, going to leave it in college and just no say, way. hey, it was a great story, and I followed it in college. But, you know, you don't get the launch pad of, hey, if she – like you talked about Magic and Bird, right? Yeah. If they had met in the Elite Eight and, you know – Yeah, well, but she, she had They her. met in the title game. It launched them into the NBA. But she already got her title game. That was my analogy. Larry Bird had a smaller school that got to the title game, right. lost to Magic. Right. And that was enough stardom for him to be a, you know, he already had been on three SI covers before he got to the pros. That was enough to make him a star. I, I'll bet you show bet that Caitlin Clark's first WNBA game is the highest rated WNBA game of all time. I well, it depend. I think it depends what happens in this tournament. I do. I, I think you got to keep. This is like it's almost just like um, fame in America or mm. fame in the world. You got to. There's like a trajectory, and it, I'm not saying you're going to keep. You're not going to have any sidetracks or anything, but you got to strike while the iron's hot. You got to keep it going. But she became such a gigantic star with no success. I, I no tournament success. The year before they made the final game, right. they, they didn't do anything in the tournament, and she was already completely transcended. Mostly because her style of play, that she's sort of the Steph Curry of the sport. Now everybody's going to be like her and shoot from 40 feet away. So I I think she's fine one way or the other. Let's go to the phones. 855-212-4CBS. Derek is in Sacramento, has a thought on the pressure on Caitlin Clark is higher than any other singular basketball player, male or female, in this tournament, in my opinion. Derek, how are you? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure. Thank you guys for having me on. Yeah. What's on your mind? You know, I, I'm right there with you guys. I think she's definitely under the most pressure. I feel like if it wasn't for Angel Reese and her going back and forth last year, she wouldn't have that energy coming into this season. So we're all looking forward to that. Right. Um, but I think if she if she goes out in, in the Elite Eight, or not even making it to the, the Final Four, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think she's going to lose some luster going into, going into the WNBA. I think – that first game is going to be a super highly rated game, but I think it goes away after that. I, I really feel like that's such a huge separation of college fans to WNBA professional fans. And yeah. me being here in Sacramento, our women's team winning one of the first inaugural, our only championship <laughs> out here, you know, it, it's tough. So, you know, I, I, it's going to be tough yeah. if she goes out early. You know, Derek, and thank you for the phone call. And, you know, I think as opposed to if she really shows up in this tournament, and listen, she showed up at every turn, so I have no reason to doubt her. But if she should really shows up in this tournament, I just think that the wave continues right into the draft. 
And then into the WNBA season, she goes out in the third round. You know, she goes out in the Sweet 16 or something. Well, I mean, they oh. face LSU before they get to the Final Four. If they she lose, got a tough draw. Yeah, if they lose that game, I, I completely disagree. I think your WNBA moment is going to be gigantic. So I, I'm so positive it'll be the biggest story the WNBA has ever had. Let's go to Angie, is in Georgia. Good morning, Angie. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me on. You got it. What's up? Hey, I have two, I have two different thoughts on this. Um, I'm a Purdue fan, uh, and I've watched it happen with our star, you know, Zach Eady, um, in the men. There's no way there's not going to be blowback. Everybody, they rail on Purdue every year because we joke every year. I'm a faithful fan. Yes, I am. Fair. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No one knows a bit more than you. No one's arguing with you, Angie. We agree completely. That first point, check and check. (laughs) Yes. So there's no way they're not. She's not going to have any blowback if she doesn't do well. Yeah. But at the same time, I've got young kids at home. Like one's a 13 year old girl, one's a 17 year old boy, and they talk about her all the time, all the time. I think if she when she goes into the WNBA, whether she makes it and they win this thing or not. There's, it's going to be huge. It will definitely be huge because yeah. there are so many young people who know who she is and are following her and are watching her videos and watching her on YouTube, and she's huge. I, Angie, I, I, I totally agree with you. The one thing I would also ask, because like we're all parents here, so uh, I think we know, how short is your kid's attention span? They both really like basketball. Okay. They're like me. So like maybe they'll stick around for it. Here, so. I just, I, yeah. and I, I'm not discounting that. And I'm, I'm glad that your kids are loving basketball and that they're taking after you. And that's great. Uh, thank you for the phone call. I just think that kids' attention spans, mm. everyone's attention span is just really, really short right now. Mm. And if somehow Caitlin fails to at least get to the final four, is our attention span just going to turn to something else? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I don't think that, you know, last year's tournament was a big deal, but she'd already become sort of an Instagram star long before that. I think that's a really good point. By the way, the Purdue and Iowa are completely different. Purdue is taller than every team they will face. They have Zach Eady. They're gigantic. They're talented. It's a totally different situation. Iowa's front court is going to be way smaller if they get to the Final Four. I still think they have a little engine that could feel to them. Where they're a Purdue, one seed. <laughs> I, I still, I, you know what? Yeah, but they're not the high recruits from these other schools. I I, th- I think there's a little bit they should you know why is Iowa a one seed where are they going to be when she's gone they're going to go back to being a ten seed I, I just I view this team they're not a powerhouse like Purdue should be winning titles and it's been how many years right now they just have all this talent this NBA talent I mean, they've been number one seed I just think they're very different teams they're they're physically superior to their opponents and they're probably going to blow it again. Peter Schwartz is here doing updates for us this morning. By the way, you're welcome to call in on Caitlin Clark, 855-212-4CBS. Good morning, Peter. And good morning, Maggie. Pierre. We are, that's right, we're still going back to that <laughs> name, aren't we? We will never leave that okay. name, Okay, all right, you know what, I'm buying into it. Good. I'll buy into it. I'll buy it. Bonjour. I, because I couldn't come up with anything better, so, <laughs> and I had a couple of weeks to think about it. Yep. Uh, we're sponsored by Progressive Insurance, drivers who switch and save with Progressive Save nearly $750 on average. Call or click today and find out if we could save you hundreds on your car insurance. We'll start with baseball. The Giants and free agent pitcher Blake Snell reportedly agree on a two-year $62 million deal, so he's off the market. The reigning National League Cy Young Award winner has an opt-out after the first season. Now to the NBA, and let's start in San Francisco. Hart searching, Peyton on him. Brunson gets it back. Open, three-pointer, pucks it in. Jalen Brunson, 26 points. And the Knicks back up by nine. That was Mike Breen on MSG. The Knicks beat the Warriors 119-112, their fourth straight win. Jalen Brunson, 34 points. Miles McBride adding 29. Now I'm beginning to get a little nervous about my Warriors prediction. Why? That, the Knicks did that to you? Uh, well, they've lost three in a row. And mm. that's not that's not a lot in the NBA. I know this kind of stuff happens. Mm. But my Warriors prediction of the last, the last dance... dance. It, it took a hit when Steve Kerr signed that massive extension, and I still thought <laughs> there could be a last dance vibe. I'm starting to 
starting to get nervous now? A little nervous. <laughs> a little nervous. Yeah. Now. Well, you know, we're running out of games. <laughs> can, I, can I offer you my Lakers? No, I'm <laughs> you nervous on that too. Uh, yeah, remember my, my take post-All-Star game, Lakers are going to turn it on. What is going on with these teams? Come on, old guys. I don't Step know. up. We should have never yeah. left the Sacramento Kings. It's a young Kings. man's league. I'm trying to tell y'all. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> By the way, speaking of your Lakers. Russell for three. Good again. D'Angelo Russell is up to 27 points on 8 of 13 shooting, 6 and 9 from 3. That was John Ireland with the call on Lakers Radio. Lakers over the Hawks, 136-105. D'Angelo Russell, 27 points. LeBron adding 25. That was a passionate call right there. <laughs> uh, I mean, wow. Catch a fever. D'Angelo Russell, Lakers. What? That is the opposite of a hockey call. Why was he so laid back about that basket? That's L.A. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess a win over the I guess a win over the Hawks is not a reason to celebrate and for the Lakers. <laughs> if I had to guess, John Ireland's got a few rings on his finger, so you know, he's probably been there, done that, and just relaxing and just enjoying the game last night. There you go. Kings over the Grizzlies, one twenty one, one eleven in overtime. Malik Monk twelve of his twenty eight points in OT, and Demonte Sabonis with his fiftieth straight double double. He had twenty five points. And 18 rebounds. Celtics beat the Pistons 119-94. Sixers over the Heat 98-91. Now let's uh, do a dive into some NBA fashion. Uh, Kim Kardashian Skims brand now partnering with six of the top college basketball players in the world to serve as models for their men's line ahead of the NCAA tournament. My name is Jared McCain. I go to Duke University. Robert Dillingham, Kentucky. Paxson Wojcik, University of North Carolina. Hunter Dickinson, Kansas. Donovan McClain, Connecticut. Caleb Love, Arizona. Everybody, 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 everybody's wearing scams. Everybody wants skims. Yeah. I thought that was a shapewear brand that helped women look thinner in yeah. their formal wear and other pieces of clothing. And now they're got Donovan Klingon. I just I didn't think that really matched with the brand. A seven foot guy from Connecticut. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about it, to be honest with you. No. So that, it, it, this is above my pay grade. I know nothing about that. Yeah, to be honest, that's not that much of a shock. Pierre. No, no, yeah. not at all. It, it was interesting. I think because these players, especially going back to high school, have such big followings on social media, I assume that is why, like, Skins was, hey, this would be a great, you know, these are yeah. great guys to get because they have, you know, some of them probably have millions of followers. I was, uh, the kid Paxson from North Carolina, I was surprised that he was in there. He, I, I, he doesn't even play for them, really. <laughs> I was like, I was like, who is that guy? Because I saw them lined up. They were on the cover of Slam Magazine. It was a pretty good, pretty cool, uh, you know, rollout. And I was like, who's that? Who's that guy? And then he was from North Carolina. I was like, I've never seen that guy on the court. And well, sure enough, he averages eight minutes a game. The Kardashians aren't stupid. <laughs> <laughs> they saw how he looks in there. Yeah, like, yeah. He's a pretty guapo guy. So yeah. oh, I just can't wait okay. till. Does Kim show up at Pittsburgh like for the first round? Is she going to be now celebrities? She's got to go to the Final Four. That would be. Well, that. Final Four is one thing, but we're going to need you in Omaha. You know, well, how about first and second round action? She in Dayton tonight? Let's really put our weight behind this. I don't, I don't, any, I don't this. know if uh, any Boise players are part of this uh, <laughs> part of the Skims promo. I was curious how much this has got to be bargain hunting for Skims. I mean, yeah. Skims has obviously got a big NBA deal, right? So yeah. and Shea Gilgis Alexander, but are he these makes pl- like fifty million. Uh, this, yeah. yeah, this this has to be much cheaper. Well, are I Both think a big people. NIL deal is, I think, a quarterback. So these guys, I I wonder how much you had to pay for that. Is this huge money well, for these the, players? Well, to EJ's point, yeah. it's like they probably all have the same social media following as Aaron Rodgers or whatever, or Caleb uh, Williams. So you might as well get the cheaper guy. Yeah, I, I think that this is a good idea. NIL yeah. is sort of cutting into that NBA money. If I was a brand, I would just do NIL every year, pay a guy. What do you have to pay these kids? $30,000 for this ad? Just a lot less yeah, than you have to Shea play Gilgis. C.J. Stroud. Yeah, yeah. Shea Gilgis Alexander, especially if he wins MVP next year, is going to be worth whatever. I, I kind of like it, and I I'm into skims for men. Really? Not you as, have them? <laughs> no, I don't. But I love compression shorts. Yeah. And if they can become, I I saw the value of the company has gone through the roof. If they could become the compression shorts and compression pants, how are they going to beat out Nike and some of the under like the other people? They're so far ahead. Undercut the price? I don't know. Just. Uh, what that's what happens in the clothing industry. Lululemon came out of nowhere yeah. and just took over the men's side. Now every dude wears Lululemon p- pants. Would you have called that? No. The amount of stockings that you guys are all wearing is really quite shocking to me. You have Dwayne Wade to thank. He's your patron saint of wearing tights. We're Actually, jealous. <laughs> getting ready for that uh, 
getting ready for that WrestleMania situation. Yeah, I had I to make a purchase. I'm going to tell you what, guys. Be careful what you wish for. Why and this is, is a PSA to all men out there who want to get into the shapewear game. I just want to tell you, be careful what you wish for. Because girdles and these kinds of things mm. that women have been wearing in some form or fashion for all these years, I just want to let you know, it's not awesome when you're eight hours in, all right? Throw a pair of high heels on that thing, then you're really going to understand what's going on with women. I'm just telling you, it can start to cut in at different yeah. points. It's going to get uncomfortable. They're your best friend in the morning. They're your worst enemy by the afternoon. You know what? One thing I really want to copy is that one-legged thing they do in women's college <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. basketball. Yeah. I don't understand it. I don't <laughs> yeah. know where you buy those. That is awesome. Yeah, so Angel, I, Reese, I think, Angel Reese thing for that one. How yeah. do you get a pair of one-legged ones? I, it must be easy to do because the are whole those, sport's like that. Are those actual? Is it one sleeve or is it? It's got an actual, or is it an actual undergarment where you put one yeah. leg through that's mad short <laughs> and the other one is down your ankle? We need to find this out. We should know <laughs> a that. Deep I dive. Feel like I think as it's, professionals, we should know that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's got to be a sleeve. You're probably wearing shorts, and then the under your yeah. basketball shorts right and then a sleeve that's got to be the longest sleeve cuz yeah. a lot of the women players they They're like 6'10 not all the players wear short yeah. shorts now they've got we've yeah. gone back in time we <laughs> guys wearing John Stockton shorts but the women of uh, sport they've always worn little shorter shorts so they're yeah. like the sleeve is mad long so just, like, i just google it you can buy plenty of one legged sleeves it's easy to buy interesting but are they yeah. the ones that go all the way up your thigh yeah yeah, yeah. it's exactly oh, like wow, that okay, and yeah. a lot of du- nba players are doing it now too one leg I got it. Do you guys remember that Saturday Night Live used to have a skit called Three Legged Jeans? <laughs> <laughs> no, and the end was great. not any dumber than acid wash. Yeah, this reminds, we're in that territory. <laughs> Three Legged Jeans. I'm going to stick with a nice, comfortable sweatshirt and a pair of jeans. Well, yeah. I'm not going to get into that. You know, and you skims, know what, Pierre? So, no yeah. one's asking you. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> but skims, you know, these Lululemon pants, it quickly, the men, uh, what happened to Lululemon, they were compression shorts, yeah. and now they have these slacks that feel like sweatpants the goal of every man in this country is to wear sweatpants every day yeah and that's diametrically opposite to what shapewear is yeah but i that's think that's not comfortable those lululemon pants are so comfortable they're like sweatpants that look like formal pants yeah. i think that's where skims is going i'd invest can i invest it's stock. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, men. <laughs> Another one. Oh. The most comfortable clothing possible. We don't have to wear high heels, so yeah, I, know. I think we're a step ahead. Aren't you all? Uh, let me uh, finish with the NFL. Newly acquired Eagles quarterback Kenny Pickett met with the media yesterday, talked about how he now gets to play for the team he rooted for as a kid. Pretty unbelievable, honestly. Um, I've been coming to games of the length since I was like five years old. You know, I have great memories of my, my dad taking me here. My grandfather, um, all my family members coming out to the games, you know, together and just having great memories. And the fact that, you know, hopefully, you know, I can help provide some great memories for, for some other families now coming up. It's it's pretty uh, surreal and a, and a full circle moment for me. There you go, Kenny Pickett. Kind of this surprised he didn't drop a curse word in there if he's been going to the link all his life. <laughs> is this a positive, getting a hometown guy? I feel that is a sort of a net zero gain. The fact that he rooted for the Eagles growing up, that doesn't mean anything about whether he's going to be good for them, right? If, if he ends up being good, it will be a fun story. If yes. he actually plays, it's like, oh, hometown guy. We love a hometown guy. I think a girl. home, I don't think, like if, you're look, Clark. if you're looking at the draft and say, say the Seahawks were looking at quarterback, just because Michael Penix played his last two years of college football, that is not a reason to take a guy. He's a hometown. In fact, I think it could be a detriment, if anything. Well, look at Kenny Pickett in Pittsburgh. Right. Well, Kenny Pickett, yeah, but yeah. Kenny Pickett's from South Jersey, so that's no. But he played at Pitt, and yeah. they drafted him, and it was a disaster. He the yeah, same stadium. I yeah. just think almost you. It's better to get a guy away from his hometown. It's the general, uh, general way I think teams view it. I think it. it's a lot more endearing when somebody, and I'm not saying they should do this. Make your own decision, but when somebody is from a place and then goes to that place for college, where you get drafted, you get drafted. That's just kind of whatever whatever team wants you. But to stay home for college, I think, is the is endearing to a lot of people. And I think a lot of athletes have talked about the distractions that come with yeah. coming home, which is why a lot of them will avoid it. There yeah. are some players who say, I don't want to play for my hometown because I know what that means in terms of the amount of access people will want to me, the friends that I'm trying to get away from that right. now will want everything to do with me. It, it's, it definitely comes with distractions, and I've, I've seen it firsthand as a Knicks fan, how many New Yorkers they try to bring back, how badly that went. Joe Kim Noah? 
Stephon Marbury. <laughs> I believe right. he said, I'm I mean, too lit for New York. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, wow. Yeah, I mean, there's literally like a list as long as, you know, the list of Jericho to <laughs> figure out, you know, how many Knicks guys they brought back because they were from New York that didn't work out. By the way, you know where he's from, right by where Mike Trout is from. So if the Phillies could get Mike Trout, then all bets are off. Oh, That's wow. a guy we <laughs> desperately want to bring home. Kenny Pickett, nice backup. Give me Trout. <laughs> and there you go. Pierre Schwartz, Peter Schwartz, thank you so much. He's going to be with us all morning long, so we're excited about that. Coming up, we see you guys on the phones. You want to talk about Caitlin Clark, the amount of pressure that is on her in this tournament, uh, more than any anyone on the men's side or the women's side. We also check in with one of our absolutely favorite college football coaches. We'll do that next. Maggie and Perloff. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. minute remaining.
45 seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Great Andrew Perloff. Big discussion today about Caitlin Clark. If you were just ranking the players with the most pressure on them heading into the tournament, men's side or women's side, she'd be number one. And I think you can put the coaches in there too. I think she's the singular person. So she is the one person who really cannot afford an early exit here. You know, I'm sorry about Purdue. I, I don't know if everyone's really on top of this revenge about, you know, them losing to Fairly Dickinson last year as a one seed, losing to a 16. I, I think Purdue is unfortunately, as a caller, uh, uh, Angie called this earlier and said the perennial chokers. I don't think people are expecting Purdue to have this big revenge. Caitlin Clark, on the other hand, final four minimum we're talking about considering how much uh, attention she gets and the, her star power. Oh, wow. You think there's n- Purdue has the most pressure on the men's side by a mile. If they have an early exit, that's a huge disaster. Nobody believes in Purdue to begin with, so but what's the what's the big deal about an early exit? If they lost in the second round, that'd be bad. But Matt Painter's not getting fired, and these aren't. Ooh, a, I, I, don't I, think so. I think that is the beginning of the end for Matt Painter, and that that would be bad. Uh, if Purdue lost again early, eeks. Uh, I mean, they were their second number one seed ever to lose. Right. If, if they lost in the first round, don't you think that would be a disaster? Well, that one would be probably a, a big disaster. But again, Matt Painter wins so many regular season games to get to these one seeds. I don't think he. I don't think he gets fired. Yeah, maybe not yet, but he's certainly got to go on the hot seat. Eight five five two one two four CBS. Tony's in North Carolina. Hey, Tony. Hey, how's it going? Uh, thanks for taking my thanks for taking my call. Um, hey, just I just wanted to weigh in. So I'm I'm a Gamecock. I went to school there. I played. Um, I've been I mean, following the team forever. But as far as Caitlin Clark, Clark goes, listen. Uh, if you got a team that could just that, that get somebody to play straight up one on one with her and keep her down, the rest of that team can't do anything. And I think her legacy going into the WNBA, she's going to go in and she'll get drafted. She'll be on a team with Ayala Boston. She'll be on a decent team. And and I think that it doesn't hurt her at all if she gets bumped in the second third round. All right. So you disagree yeah. with me, Tony. You agree with Perloff. Thank you for the phone call. Good luck to your Gamecocks. I I was so bad that they box and won her at a major D1 level. That's crazy. That's like a seventh grade zone. Okay, then how did they get to the championship game last year? I don't, well, because they're really good, but I think people were not quite ready for Caitlin. I, I think they had not coached up. Nobody expected... I, listen, you guys might disagree, but nobody expected them to beat South Carolina. That was No, but Don that Stanley's was wild. one of the great coaches, so to say they weren't ready for Caitlin I Clark, I think, is... Watch them of... watch play this year. If they get if they if South Carolina gets a hold of Iowa, then they'll be ready. Let's go to Danny's in Wisconsin. Hey, Danny. How you doing? Danny? Hey, this is, this is Danny. How are you doing? We're doing good. What's on your mind? Hey, I wanted to just say that I do feel that after watching Wisconsin and Purdue play this weekend, the Purdue's only going to go as far as the refs let Edie play. Yeah. I mean, if you guys saw that game and you saw the two egregious fouls, one where Zeke or uh, where Edie ran over Crawl, and the other one where he ran over um, our uh, point guard. I mean, it was just. Amazing, and then they called the fifth fall and crawl. I just feel that uh, they're only going to go as far as the refs let them play. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things, Danny. It's and appreciate the call. How do you officiate a seven foot five, two hundred seventy yeah. pound guy? No, it's a, it's a huge deal, and also he's just a little slow, so he does tend to draw some contact. Man, now that we talk about it, I, I'm 
dying to see what Purdue does because there are, there are actually some experts who are picking them to win it all this year. I know, Maggie, you're way more skeptical. Yeah, well, listen, Zach Eady in that game, um, looking at their last game against Michigan State, went to the free throw line 14 times. It's yeah. not like he's not getting calls, but it's a great point by the caller. How are the refs going to officiate him because he's just such a challenge? Uh, do you know off the top of your head how far you have Purdue going? Are you gonna are you gonna pencil them in? It's scary when you actually have to sit there at that line and look at Purdue getting to the Final Four. It's not easy. I have them losing to Gonzaga. There you hey. go. There you go. Okay, coming up. Oh, we check in on the San Francisco 49ers. Don't move. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining.
45 seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. a violin prodigy. Her full name is Maggie the Stallion. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. The road back to the Super Bowl for the 49ers is going to get a whole lot tougher. Hey, welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. We get back to March Madness in just a moment, but Perloff, we got to take a pivot just to talk about the 49ers for a second. We got a report that came out yesterday from a radio host in Jacksonville who said that there was some interest that the 49ers would trade Brandon Ayuk, the leading receiver on their team a year ago. And you might argue one of the biggest reasons why they even got to the Super Bowl in the first place because of the amazing face mask catch that he had in the NFC Championship game against the Detroit Lions, which really was the turning point of that game. Oh, the butterfly catch, right? (laughs) Because he saw a butterfly and that's why he caught the ball. I actually forgot about that, but right. Unbelievable. So Brandon Ayuk, a very important piece to the San Francisco 49ers. Cannot understate that and underline that enough. There was a report that the 49ers were entertaining the idea of trading him to Jacksonville for the 17th overall pick and Zay Jones. Now, that seems like it's fizzled out, but now it's out there, right? That perhaps the 49ers are looking to move on from Brandon Ayuk. And this is what happens when even if you're not paying your quarterback because they're not paying Brock Purdy yet and he's still cheap for one more year, the anticipation of having to pay Purdy, the big deal you gave to Nick Bosa, the big deal that you gave to Debo Samuel, the fact that you are a very good team and you are an expensive team. And I know the salary cap spiked this year, but you can't expect that that's going to happen year after year. And this is what can happen to teams As soon as you find a little bit of success, if you don't break through and actually win the Super Bowl, your road becomes so much harder. Well, it's still on the rookie uh, quarterback deal. So that's one thing. For one more year. Then you don't think that after the third year they're going to pay Purdy? Come on. Well, (laughs) you're assuming sustained success for Brock Purdy, which is new for you. (laughs) Well, a Super Bowl and an NFC Championship game? I mean, it's pretty good for Mr. Irrelevant. I think he's getting paid after year three. Yeah, well... Is he going to stay upright and have another MVP season? If they do that, then they're they're going to the Super Bowl again. So I think if you think Brock Purdy is earning a two hundred million dollar deal, they're already in good shape. That's a luxury problem they want. But here's the thing: the Niners have been there; they've sustained success through these two cycles because they were in the Super Bowl in nineteen, got decimated by injuries, and then they made two straight conference title games, and then the Super Bowl. So Kyle Shanahan is such a good coach and has such a good system that he's getting deep into the playoffs. And I think that's significant. They're not going away. They're not this uh, flash in the pan just because they had an affordable quarterback. Uh, I mean, listen, if when Nick Bose is not on the field, they're obviously a different team. But other than that, I think that they can replace any of their parts. I See, really mean that. I don't think so. And I think the 49ers have shown you that they don't think so because they made the big deal for Christian McCaffrey. Yeah, but they got to the Super Bowl without Christian McCaffrey. Okay, but they obviously felt like they needed someone to put them over the top, and McCaffrey was the one to do it. Now, they're not taking all of McCaffrey's salary, but let's talk about McCaffrey, who the running back market is certainly depressed, but if if he stays as the second most important offensive person on that team then he's going to probably want a new contract at some point. So You got you mean Kittle. behind Debo Samuel? So Debo got paid. George <laughs> Kittle got paid. McCaffrey doesn't make nothing. Uh, and now look at Brandon Ayuk again, and this is the story that came out yesterday, that he that the 49ers may have been talking with the Jacksonville Jaguars about a trade for, for Ayuk. Ayuk is going into the fifth year of his rookie deal. He's not going to play on that. 
Nick Bosa didn't play on that. He's not going to play on that. So you have to do something here. And the wide receiver market didn't actually do the 49ers a lot of favors this offseason. Mm-hmm. Michael Pittman averaging $23 million a year. Calvin Ridley averaging $23 million a year. Brandon Ayuk's numbers are right on par with those guys in some cases better. He's going to want that big contract where Debo Samuel is already getting paid $23 million. So you're going to tell me that the 49ers who are trying to get back to the Super Bowl, that it's a good idea to have two wide receivers making $50 million? No, I can let Ayuk go. See, but I don't think it's that easy. I think he's a lot more important to what the 49ers are doing than you think. He's Get a high the- first-round pick or medium first-round pick and draft another receiver. Okay, well, the Jacksonville deal, which was allegedly 17th overall in Zay Jones, fell apart. And the reason why is because that's kind of rich when you also have to pay Ayuk if you're the team who's receiving him. So you're going to give away a first-round pick and you're going to give him you know, $23 million a year on top of it. I think it's a pipe dream that the 49ers are going to be able to get a first-round pick for Ayuk. Oh, okay. Then that that speaks to the value of Ayuk. He's not T. Higgins. I think he's valuable to this team. Yeah, I he's think they can replace him. He's a leading receiver last year. You know how I feel about wide receivers. They're a bit generic. They can get other guys. I think it's the Shanahan system. I think Ayuk's a great player, and he's really good in that system. And I think he would. I think he's going to get worse if he goes to another team. And Debo is the key. Debo, I think, is as important as McCaffrey, if not more. Their losing, little losing streak, that three-game losing streak, yeah. coincide with Debo getting nicked and up. And Trent Williams. I, I, but yeah. Debo has a health issue. Ayuk has been, be, has been durable and available for them. And, you know, here's the thing about why I disagree with you, that it's just the system. If it was just the system, they wouldn't pay anybody. But they pay everybody. They pay Kittle. They pay Debo. They, again, trade for Christian McCaffrey, who's got the highest, you know, uh, contract of any running back. And I yeah. know he's a hybrid, but still, they pay everyone. So if they felt like ever, they if they felt like these pieces were so interchangeable, they wouldn't pay anybody. I think that they're doing that because of the quarterback. If the quarterback gets expensive, then they're going to rotate all these guys out. Obviously, they're only paying them now because they haven't been had to pay a quarterback. They had to pay somebody here, and those are great players. I, I just think that they're going to be fine without Ayuk because they have had different shapes in this little mini run. They, you know, obviously, I always think of the Raheem Mostert game. To me, that was that was a system. Raheem Mostert in 2019 playoffs just ran all over everybody. I think their system lends to a big running attack. I even think they can survive without McCaffrey. McCaffrey's going to wear down eventually. Uh, if Brock Purdy's as good as he was last year, this team is not going anywhere. Yeah, but that's the thing. Purdy is going to get paid. so I you still have think to, they're going to be really, really good. Okay, so but you have to decide. Purdy's going to get paid after year three, right? You have to be at least three years in the league to get a contract renegotiation. I mean, Purdy's the biggest bargain of and even more than Russell Wilson. Yeah, I mean, and he doesn't have the fifth-year guarantee because he wasn't a first-round pick. Exactly. So he's he's going to get something massive. And again, you've got to be thinking down the line here. Do you really want $50 million wrapped up in two receivers? And I'm just going to disagree with you that you think Ayuk is not important. I, it's I think a, it's he a great is. wide receiver draft. You can bargain hunt. If they could have gotten the 17th pick for Ayuk, and with that contract size, that would have been a very reasonable deal and would have made a lot of sense because you're right. You can't pay everyone forever. Right. I think Ayuk is the one piece. If you give me, give me a choice. If I was going to do an open draft of those four guys, the stars we mentioned, McCaffrey, Debo, George Kittle, and Ayuk. I'm sorry. I have Ayuk fourth and he's great, right. but I still have him fourth because McCaffrey is the best running back. Kittle's top five quarter, uh, tight end, top three, tight end, maybe top two. And then I'm a huge Debo fan. So I would give the edge to Debo, even though he is less durable. Man, and they've already, I mean, that's just on the offensive side. On the defensive side, Bosa and Hargrave. I mean, these guys, this is not cheap here for well, this team. Right, but they paid, for example, Hargrave. Fred Warner. That's a function of the cheap quarterback. I don't think they're going to ha- be able to go out and get a Javon Hargrave once they pay Purdy. Charvarius Ward is not cheap. I mean, it is, this is, th- this is what I'm saying. The 49ers have a decision to make on Brandon Ayuk. What this underscores is just how much harder it becomes to keep your team together once you get good, but you don't break through because you're in your window. So you got to keep spending. You can't reset now. You got to keep spending. And eventually you have to make really tough decisions. And this is where you and I disagree. I think it'd be a huge mistake to get rid of Ayuk. And I bet if you 
gave them some truth serum. I wonder if they could offload Debo and keep Ayuk if they would do it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the league would want Debo because of the injury history. Yeah. They, don't, they don't want to pay him. It's a good point. But I, I kind of think... The 49ers Debo, just paid him. The Debo is the heart and soul of that team in a way. And I'm going against analytics. And just they just looked different when he wasn't out there. They didn't get that tough yard. Uh, and also, by the way, Ayuk could disappear as well. Look at the Super Bowl. He was pretty much a non-factor. I, I still think San Francisco is going to be great. Uh, here's the thing about wide receiver, too. Um, Ayuk and all these guys, they have these young uh, rookies coming up who are going to be much cheaper and much more productive. I think the, the Niners are going to be good for not just this year. I think they'll be two or three years. Counterpoint to all that, Tyreek Hill got traded from Kansas City and they won two Super Bowls. You right. can't afford to put all the money into a number one wide receiver yeah. for a lot of teams. So if Kansas City can do it, San Francisco can do it, because that's the, the league they're in. I, I think, they're in the top three teams almost every year now. Yeah. I, I think there's another part of this. If you were really sitting down, you know, having a drink with a 49er fan, and you said, how do you feel about going into the season? I think they would probably feel probably a lot more disheartened than what you're painting. And the reason why is because any 49er fan will tell you being healthy at the end of the year is a luxury that they have not been able to have for many, many seasons. And I know Dre Greenlaw tore his ACL, was ACL Achilles in the Super Bowl. I know that he got hurt in the Super Bowl, but you had amazing health at the end of the year. Everybody who you needed except for Hufunga, who was out, and again, Greenlaw got hurt in the Super Bowl. You had everybody that you needed, and you couldn't win. And you got to overtime, and it was close, but ultimately you lost. And that's where I think you start to like get a little nervous, and you're clenching a little bit if you're a 49er fan because you've seen seasons go totally sideways because of injuries. You were healthy last year. You're in the game. You have a lead. You end up blowing that lead, going to overtime and losing, and that's the one that's going to be the hardest to get over. Yeah, I mean, would you have said that, though, when they blew the lead to Kansas City? What's different? And it took them four years to get back. It's not like they were right yeah. back in it the next season. But if, if it took Brock... four years and, like, a quarterback situation that could have blown up so spectacularly in their face, and they kick-saved in a beauty with it, with the Mr. Irrelevant. But honestly, they, they blew two uh, championship games. One, they should have beaten the Rams. Yeah. Uh, if Jacuzzi, uh, I can't say his first name. If Tart drops, uh, catches that interception that was in his hands. They go to the Super Bowl, maybe win it. Probably could have beaten the Bengals, and then they were right there with the Eagles. And Brock Purdy hurts his elbow early right. in the game. So I, I think Niners fans probably they might be tired of this, but the fact is that they're not going anywhere. Why would you bet against this team? Why would you bet against Kyle Shanahan? I know he can't win the big game, but he wins because he, a he doesn't know the rules of overtime. I mean, we're not wins, sure. He wins a lot of playoff games. No, he games. does win a lot of playoff games, but this is this is the thing that happens with a lot of teams who get close but don't break through. It doesn't get less painful just because you keep contending. It gets more painful because the, the stakes get higher and the losses get more difficult and harder to deal with. They are so talented, though. I, I, right now, I looked on DraftKings. They're the Super Bowl favorite over the Chiefs, and I understand that because the Chiefs, Three in a row seems impossible. It's right. a historical anomaly that we've never seen. Feels like the Chiefs have a lot stacked against them. The Niners have one big advantage. They're in the NFC, Maggie. There's no Chiefs. It's not your Buffalo Bills are going to get mowed down by Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs again. They have a great chance to get there again. And I think I'm going to quote Jerry Jones. All you want to do is be around the rim. They have every chance. I think this is... An, it has to be exciting. If Niners fans, maybe you're right. The bar has Don't raised. tell that to the Niner fan. I mean, that's, you, that's fine for the front great, office. That's a, not cool for the fans. There's a great chance you're going to be there again. There's, I they mean, don't want to just be there again. They've been there. Being there for a franchise like the 49ers doesn't, does diddly squat for you. I got of to course you, you're going to be there. You're the freaking 49ers. You want to win. If you get to the Super Bowl again, you have a great chance of winning. I mean, this, this game came down to a coin flip. It could have gone either way. I think if if I could tell you right now, you're going to get to the Super Bowl two times in the next four years. That's Niners fans should be happy because there's a great chance you're going to win one of these. Eventually, <laughs> eventually. I mean, these games have been decided by a sliver. Eventually, one of these is going to turn your way. you got to be there. Listen, if Niners fans are going to complain about two more shots in the big game, I'm sorry, what, what do you expect? You have to get to the Super Bowl to win the Super Bowl. Okay, there it is... Uh, virtually impossible for the team who lost in the Super Bowl the year before to get back to the Super Bowl. It does not happen. Happen to the Patriots, of yeah, course. But Everything it, happens it, to the Patriots. It does not happen. Virtually impossible for the Chiefs to repeat. That that was a huge anomaly, let alone three-peat. The, different pressure. 
different pressure. Kansas City, they've got money in the bank. They've got money to burn now. At three Pete, I don't even know if they're even feeling the pressure on that. I know they want to, but they've got titles. We're talking about Mahomes being on par with Brady. Like, we'll put that to the side. You're talking about pressure. This is the 49ers. And again, they have not won in this era. And you you are going against so much history to get even back to the game. And you don't even have the pelts on the wall with this current iteration that you can do it. You've gotten there, but you haven't broken through. It makes it way more painful. Yeah, I mean, I kind of expect 13 and four in another playoff run. Uh, unless there's major, major injuries if Purdy gets hurt, which could happen. This team obviously has a lot of injuries. I mean, there's just so much talent on this roster. And I think it's a huge upgrade to get rid of Steve Wilkes and go back to a former assistant. Uh, Nick, is it Nick or Daniel Sorensen? One of the Sorensen twins <laughs> who are actually <laughs> not, not related. Twins. <laughs> yeah. I, I just think their defense took a, such a huge step back last year, and I think that'll get... They be, I mean, they immediately became an offensive team. If they get back to a number one defense, which I think is very possible, they're going to win a ton of football games. The San Francisco 49ers, we got word yesterday that... They were talking to the Jacksonville Jaguars about trading Brandon Ayuk for the 17th overall pick and Zay Jones. That did not materialize, but obviously it looks like Brandon Ayuk certainly on the trade block. He's on in his fifth year, going into his fifth year, needs to get paid, but the 49ers have paid a lot of people. So this becomes a lot harder for them if they want to keep Ayuk. Uh, all right, you're welcome to weigh in on that. 855 212 for cbs Coming up. Maggie and Perloff's March Madness bracket of one-hit wonders. We go to the last call region. We did weddings yesterday. Today is last call. <laughs> Desperate times, last call. <laughs> yeah, last call. We do that next. We are counting down 64. We're finding the greatest one-hit wonder of all time. Don't move. Maggie and Perloff. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two 
two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. You know what time it is. One hit wonder week on Maggie and Perloff. We're doing our <laughs> annual alternative bracket. We've done the bracket of stuff, the bracket of things we hate. This year it is one hit wonders, sort of old school. The bracket of one hit wonders went up yesterday. You can find it at Maggie and Pearl on Twitter slash X. Wow, this is getting really heated. There's a there's some close competitions, some upsets. Uh, some strong contenders in the first round, Maggie, and now we're ready to reveal the second bracket today. Oh, first rack bracket was gangbusters yesterday. So you uh, can go vote, and it's your vote that determines who moves on into the next round. Perloff laid it out there beautifully. First bracket yesterday was awesome. You guys loved it. So let's hit bracket region number two. We did weddings yesterday. This is the last call region in the Maggie and Perloff bracket of one hit wonders. And let's get to it. The number one overall seed in this bracket is Sir mix lots Baby Got Back. Like big butts and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. And when a girl walks in with an itty bitty waist and a round thing in your face, you get sprung. Want to pull up to... And a strong one yeah. seed it is. How come they don't make songs like that anymore? <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame. They are going up against the 16 seeded Hey There Delilah by the Plain White Tees. Oh, it's what you do to me. Oh, it's what you do to me. Oh, it's what you do to me. True story. This is a song that EJ had never heard of. Yeah. Uh, the eighth this is, seed. This had 98 too. <laughs> Anybody who does Hey There to Lila over Baby Got Back, I don't want to be your friend. <laughs> the eighth seed in the last call region of One Hit Wonders is Kung Fu Fighting. The AC Kung Fu Fighting going up against Hey Mickey by Tony Basil. Wow, that is a powerhouse 8 9 matchup. <laughs> well, this is a big one. Kung Again. Fu Fighting comes into any movie. I'm instantly happy. And Hey Mickey, <laughs> I was watching Bring It On with the girls the other day, the 2001 cheerleading movie. The last scene they do Hey Mickey. Ah, so good in movies. Great songs. All right, we're doing the one-hit wonders bracket here on Maggie and Perloff, the fifth seed in the last call region, 99 Luft Balloons. Wow, 
Wow, went with the German version. There is an English version too. <laughs> yeah. EJ probably had no idea about no, the no. English German version. We went with the original. Is well, the German version. Right, right, right. But the in America, I think the English version was released and became a number one. I just went on one Spotify one. and saw the one that had the most plays, and that was one of the most plays, so that's the German. one that got played. <laughs> the 99 love I, I personally am preferential to the German version myself. Yeah. I've I, never actually thought about this. <laughs> <laughs> and you're thinking about it now for that the first time. That means 99 red balloons. Yeah. Thank you for the translation, Rosetta Stone. Uh, the fifth <laughs> seed is going up against number 12. The song is called Torn. Okay. Uh, Natalie and Bruglia, if we're doing, she's going to win <laughs> some reaches on her own there. <laughs> yeah. Quite quite attractive. Anyway. She is. Thank you, TRL, for bringing us that yeah. song. Uh, number four seed in the last call region of One Hit Wonders, Who Let the Dogs Out? Let the dogs out. Who, 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 who. Got some good and also equally painful moments from the 2000 World Series of the Mets. Uh, okay, fourth seed is going up against the 13 seated Rex in effect, Rump Shaker. <laughs> wow. So we got baby, uh, got back. Uh, and, and Rump Shaker. Shaker. This is the last call bracket. <laughs> the last call region. Uh, six seed in the last call region. We're doing best one hit wonders, Maggie and Perloff. Uh, just a friend. Oh, baby, you start with a knee. Would you say he just a friend? Would you say he just a friend? Very strong six seed by Biz Marquis going up against the 11th seeded closing time. I know who I want to take me home. I know who I want to take me home. All right, we are going through the last call bracket, uh, region rather, of the Maggie and Perloff One Hit Wonders bracket. Number three and a strong three seed. It's Return of the Mac by Mark Morrison. <laughs> Who's the artist? Mark Morrison, right? God, who's that? <laughs> <That's just> the, <laughs> I know that song really, really well. <laughs> it's the That's the best like, part about One Hit Wonders. No clue who sang Yeah, it. a lot of these songs, I'm like, yeah, I know that song. Like, I memorized that song. I had no <laughs> idea who the artist was. I just well, assumed he was a great artist until he was on this list. <laughs> Because I was like, that song's awesome. He's got to have other great songs. And sure enough, Yeah, really. who is he? If he walked in right now, would you know him? Absolutely not. <laughs> no shot. <laughs> Thanks for the memories, though. Uh, that is the three-seed return on the Mac going up against the 14-seeded Play That Funky Music. That could have been in the weddings region. I personally banned that song from my own wedding, but uh, I know it's a popular one. All right, we are in the last call well, region. You didn't give the artist. Pro I'm sorry, Wild Cherry. Yeah, who are they? <laughs> I know that song again. Is it more than I, one person? I have no idea. I couldn't have told you that in a million years. <laughs> So we are doing the last call region, the Maggie and Perloff one hit wonder bracket, the seven seated Chumba Wumba with tub thumping. Now you would think that that'd be a very strong contender. I think that was, I read that was number one for 17 weeks, maybe the most in American history. Oh. It is a huge song. All right. Well, take that tub thumping. You line up with number 10 seated 8675309. Oh, no. Tommy Two Tone and finishing out this region, the Maggie and Perloff One Hit Wonders bracket. Second seated, come on, Eileen. Immortalized in the movie Tommy Boy. Thank you for that. They go up against 15 seated 
Frankie Goes to Hollywood with the song Relax. All right, there you go. So we have the Maggie of Pearl off the last call region of the March Madness one mm-hmm. hit wonder bracket. You can go vote now at Maggie and Pearl on Twitter. How come nobody from the years 1982 through 1986 had a second hit? <laughs> because I mean, if you could write Jenny eight six seven five three zero nine, you can't write a second hit song. That song is perfect. <laughs> yeah, come on, Eileen, Jenny. A lot of these from the I mean, same era. I mean, this started with Baby Got Back. This is a strong so, one yeah. seed in this region. So when collecting these songs, I actually did a different approach because the on Sunday I actually did it on YouTube and yeah. I kept having the issues. I kept saying while well, I was putting in words and there were multiple songs with the same name. So this time I went to Spotify to rank them. What was awesome was you could actually see how many streams each song has. So when I would go to an artist, you'd see again Mark Morris of Return of the Mac, three hundred million streams. The next song, a million. <laughs> Thousand. <laughs> or like, yeah, or like next or, you know, torn. Five hundred million streams. Next one 900,000. Like their <laughs> yeah. second best song yeah. is literally like 500 Nothing. times less listened to. It's crazy. You know, the fight one, and come on, Eileen, whenever VH1 does a one hit wonder, that was the post, those guys wearing those weird jumpsuits, uh, Dexy's Midnight Runners. Yep. What were they wearing? They sort of had no shirt and a, what's that called when you have the, uh, Overall? The overalls with no shirt look. I think that added to their one-hit wonder because <laughs> that look was so iconic and bizarre. <laughs> that just screams 1983 to me. I don't know what year it came out. It had to be 83, right? <laughs> I think we're using the word iconic. We're really stretching that. Oh, you, that that's just, Everybody, you see a guy with no shirt and overalls, oh, come on, Eileen. I, think <laughs> I see it, a guy with no shirt and overalls. I'm crossing the street. That's definitely <laughs> iconic. Or Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Yeah. Right, Pete? Yeah. yeah. The two by four. One. That's right. Tough guy. All right, so there you go. You can go vote. This is a very strong region. Uh, we will have, uh, what are we doing tomorrow, uh, EJ? Are we doing cruising region or cruising. the turn it up region? Okay. Cruising. So we're doing the cruising region tomorrow. The turn it up region. <laughs> I can't. That's awesome. There you go. Go vote at Maggie and Pearl. Peter Schwartz is here with headlines. Good morning, Peter. Uh, good morning, Maggie. We'll start with baseball and the Giants and free agent pitcher Blake Snell have reportedly come to terms on a two year deal worth 62 million dollars to the reigning National League Cy Young Award winner finally has a home. He has an opt-out as well after the first season. Now to the By NBA. the way, I'm sorry. Scott Boris, yes. clients, yeah. not a great offseason. I mean, no. you're still rich as all get out, so good for you, but these are not the contract numbers that I think Cody Bellinger was planning on, Matt Chapman, now Snell. His clients are not I, – I, we go back. We're Mets fans. Michael Conforto sat out a season yep. because Boris gave him such terrible advice. It seems like we're seeing – it's funny because this is a sport where we think of money ball winning, and yet you know, it seems like nobody was doing the money ball approach. It does feel like there's a different approach for a lot of these teams that are just not going to get duped by giving the guy $200 million off I of know. one good season. Or even Blake Snell has been a really good pitcher for a long time and still Multiple won't, Cy Young winner. Yeah, still won't commit to a long-term deal for those kind of guys. And these teams are getting smarter and I wonder if the Boris approach is perhaps losing a little bit a little bit of his luster. Isn't Pete Alonso a Boris guy? Yeah. Yes. And they're so not even to, talking. I mean, so you have to wonder if you're Pete Alonso like am I getting a deal or You just yeah. saw Michael Conforto, one of your teammates not too long ago, have have no takers. Michael Conforto in the middle of his career, he's not a terrible player. It was a purely botched contract situation. And Juan Soto, too, right? So yeah, Juan we'll Soto. see about Soto. Yeah, we'll see. Now the NBA, and we'll start with the Kings and the Grizzlies going to overtime. Out to Sabonis. Dribble handoff to Malik. Can he do it again? Pocket pass back to Sabonis. The two-hand hammer. That could be a dagger. It's 115-107. Malik Monk with the assist pass for Demata Sabonis with an emphatic two-hand throwdown. That was Gary Gerald on Kings Radio. Over time, Malik Monk scored 12 of his 28 points in the OT, and the Kings over the Grizzlies, 121-111. DeMontis Sabonis recording his 50th straight double-double, 25 points mm. and 18 rebounds. Now to Philadelphia. Lowry with it, spinning, dribbling into the lane, jump stop, goes up, underhand scoop. It's good! How did he do it? Kyle Lowry puts it up and in. 95-89 Sixers, 90 seconds to go. A frenzied crowd here in Philadelphia. That was Tom McGinnis on Sixers Radio. Sixers over the Heat, 98-91. 30 points for Tyrese Maxey, 16 for Kyle Lowry. 
You had the Lakers over the Hawks, 136, 105, 27 for D'Angelo Russell and 25 for LeBron James. Knicks win their fourth in a row, beat the Warriors, 119, 112, 34 points for Jalen Brunson. The Celtics beat the Pistons, 119, 94. Jalen Brown had 31 points. College basketball, it was a rough selection Sunday for the Big East as they only had three teams going to the tournament in the Big East yesterday with a lengthy statement saying how understandably very disappointed some of their teams are that they did not get picked for the NCAA tournament. The only three teams going, UConn, Marquette, and Creighton. And you had teams like St. John, Seton Hall, and Providence who were all characterized as snubs. Yeah, the Big East statement didn't really do it for me. It was kind of like, oh, you know, we'll, well, we'll do better the next time. I mean, it didn't have a lot of teeth. I know they... It's because they can't do anything about Rick it. Rick Pitino's words the, on, in his statement in his press conference the other day went a little deeper. Yeah, and n- nobody in their right mind wants to hear Rick Pitino complain about this. So, I, or very few people. I don't think he gets a lot of sympathy uh, nationwide. It's one of those weird things where you have you know three teams essentially ranked in the top ten in this bracket. You got three teams: Creighton, UConn, Marquette, all top three seeds. But uh, the other teams that missed out, they had very few wins against teams in the field. So. Yes, you have elite teams, and maybe there is a suggestion that maybe some of those teams are maybe overseas, not UConn, maybe Marquette and uh, and Creighton if you're not valuing St. John's and those teams. But at the same time, if you're, not, if you're not beating teams in the field, how do you think you just get in because you're adjacent to UConn? Yeah, yeah like I, I don't know if that really quite makes sense either. I, I love the Big East. I'm a Northeaster, but I didn't have much of an issue with them getting left out. Spring training baseball yesterday. The uh, Yankees beat the Phillies 4-3. to three. Carlos Rodon, five and two-thirds, no hit innings. And then it was time for him to come out of the game. But Aaron Boone did not come take him out of the game. He sent somebody else, maybe with a little more experience in this department. Aaron Boone predicted that he was going to do this. And this is a really special spring training scene. Joe Torre takes the ball from Carlos Rodon after five and two-third, no hit innings. What a sight to see that legend back in uniform. That was pretty cool to see that yesterday, number six, walking out. Oh, shut up in there. Sit down, Met Boy. Ovation. Sit down, Met Boy. (laughs) Spring training. Let's go. Sit down, Met Boy. Get going. Sit down. Here's Next. a question. Did they used to do they have they done this before? I the had Yankees? never seen it. the last time the Yankees sent somebody out to make a pitching change that was not out of the oh, ordinary Jeter and Pettit. was Jeter and Pettit went out to get the yeah. ball from Mariano. But I thought that was pretty no, cool yesterday. That's why this is corny. Because that Does Mariano, Joe Girardi get it? Yeah, Mariano <laughs> is his last game getting getting that kind of treatment with the the the, the vets on the squad coming out to to honor him, that's one thing. A spring training game with Carlos Rodon, who's basically been public enemy number one in New York City. Uh, you, you send out Joe Torre? Joe Torre! Well, this is, I know this is going to get Pearl off uh, upset because you always say the older managers wearing the baseball uh, uniform is uh, something. Yeah, was that... Torre in you? He was in the uniform. He was wearing oh, yeah. the Yankee oh, yeah. spring training jersey no, with number six on the back. Not upset. I think it's kind of awesome. Oh, I thought <laughs> yeah. you didn't like it. I think it's so funny and so dumb. <laughs> it's it's great. Uh, the Tony, yeah, it's like awesome. Like the idea that Joe Torre could go out and start fielding grounders. Well, right? it's, or we, going back behind the plate, I guess. Have we figured old. out how this started? Why is the manager? in this sport wearing the uniform where it doesn't happen in any other sport. Has anyone, is there any background on that? I think it's got to be player coach from That's back in the day, and it's just a tradition right, that Basketball had player coach. I think we got to change it. But there were also a lot of times... Football had player coach, too. A lot of times you never saw Tory wearing the jersey in the dugout coming out to the, take out a pitcher. He always used to wear a jacket, yep. or he would wear because a he's pullover. an elderly man. Yeah, well, but <laughs> that, so yesterday he... Came yeah. out with the batting practice jersey, which but, I again, I as a Yankee fan, I thought that was pretty awesome. To best see. of all time is Tommy Lasorda. Well, sport, and he wouldn't wear a jacket; he'd let it all hang out there. <laughs> it's going to be a great moment when Carlos Rodon's giving up nine earned over three innings. They're going to remember. Hey, we remember we honored him with Joe Torre coming out of a spring training game to take him out of the game. He was trying to talk Torre into keeping him in because apparently he had a seventy-five pitch limit and he had only thrown seventy-two. And so they were, if you see the video, you see the two of them smiling at yeah. each other. And I think he said, I had three more pitches. And Tori said, I, I was told to take you out now. And he said, okay, he's a legend. I'll come out now. <laughs> can we do this serious? with other, can we have like, is Joe Madden going to come back to a Cubs spring training? Or can we get Jim Leland going back Joe, to the Tigers? Joe Madden have, those guys have four World Series rings in five years. I, he broke a curse. And that's, that's sort of a weird parting though with Madden and the Cubs. I don't think he's going back anytime soon. Okay, well, how about uh, Terry Francona once he's done? with the Guardians to go oh, back to Boston? That, definitely. Okay. 
That I'm would just make saying, sense. Can we, is, it, is this something now? <laughs> I mean, I know how much Pete loves Bruce Bochy. I mean, now we got Bochy multiple spots. Yeah, he's got multiple spots. Oh, yeah, the real manager right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I mean, this in modern I'm, baseball, it makes more sense for the GM to come and take I'm, the pitcher out. How about Grady? <laughs> he basically does. I I send, send, the, how about, send the analytics guy out yeah. there. How about Grady Little come out for the Red Sox yeah. and yeah. Take, yeah. Out, take the ball there? Finally take the ball. <laughs> I mean, for once. A uh, little, uh, little too late for Grady <laughs> Little. Uh, close with a little NHL history from last night. Uh, right back now to Carlson. Ovechkin scores! It's his second goal of the game! And that is vintage number eight from the office. He blows Dustin Wolf away. Oh, baby, it's three. Nothing. Washington. John Walton had the call on Capitals Radio. The Capitals beat the Flames 5-2. to two. Alex Ovechkin had two goals last night. He's the third, uh, th- fourth player in NHL history now with 19 straight 20-goal seasons. Unbelievable. Peter, thank you so much for that. Coming up, Deion Sanders has advice for Caleb Williams and his son Shador. We get to all that next. Maggie and Pearl off CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain. Four minutes remaining.
it's not easy to kill a tortoise. That's the other problem. <laughs> She'll figure Trust that. me, I fantasize, I fantasize a lot about this. What, how are you going to kill it? You have to drown it, right? I've been in the draft to as high as four. We are live right at the Rose Bowl where a no big deal Penn State demolish, dominated, control. by Wesley Financial. Stuck in a timeshare and want out? Contact Wesley Financial Group now and get a free timeshare exit information kit at wesleyfinancialgroup.com. We haven't checked in on Deion Sanders in a while, Perloff, but he was doing some interviews. Um, he has some advice for Caleb Williams or maybe a warning mm -hmm. about playing in the cold weather in Chicago. He said this on Sirius XM. Uh, let me tell you something I have a problem with. This kid can flat out play. I think he's the best one on the board this year for sure. And that's a coming from California for the last couple of years and went to Oklahoma. That's not terribly cold. Chicago's cold, man. You got to think about that kind of stuff when you're taking a young man. Like when you see a guy from Ohio State, you bring him to Chicago. Okay, I can understand that. But from California to Chicago, not only that, they added, what, one or two more games, 17 games in the NFL. So basically, Dion warning Caleb yeah. Williams about playing in cold weather, but then went on and said that's why he doesn't want Shador playing in cold weather. That he doesn't want Shador ending up in a cold weather city. So a lot to unpack from Deion Sanders. He said, I don't want my kid going nowhere cold next year. He grew up in Texas. He played in Jackson, played in Colorado. Season's over before it gets cold in Colorado. I'm just thinking way ahead. I don't want that for him. Uh, that's true. College football, if you think about it, it's wrapped up by Thanksgiving. There's obviously logic here. I mean, this might this is actually not a hot take. It's a cold take because he's talking about the cold. See what I did there, yeah. dad joke? Nice one. I mean, <laughs> come on. I mean, we all know what the history of the Chicago Bears quarterback. Obviously, the argument against this is Aaron Rodgers kick butt and Brett Favre kick butt in Green Bay, which is the coldest place possible. But, I mean, Chicago's got a bad history of quarterback. Weather plays a part. And it also, you know, Josh Allen's done well in Buffalo, but yeah, I think you have to be the right kind of quarterback. Josh Allen can throw ridiculous throws in the cold weather, and even he's struggled in the cold, in the cold at times, right? He can't have the same numbers. So I, I get what Dion's saying. It's hard to argue with his logic. This is all so ridiculous. This is so ridiculous. How so? Well, because you just mentioned all those other quarterbacks who can play in cold weather, and you forgot another one, Tom Brady. So you have all these quarterbacks yeah. who can play in cold weather and have done it. And not only that, they see the cold weather as an advantage and now and can use it and found ways to use it to their advantage. This is kind of weak to me from Dion. First of all, why would you put this out there about Shador? He's never said this. Like he, he don't, don't make it seem like he's not up for the challenge of playing in a cold weather city. And beyond that, he has no uh, control over where he's going to go. But, so, but that's the basic facts of Deion Sanders. Is he is bigger than any team he's ever been on. He's Deion. He doesn't have to worry about... T he doesn't care about the draft. He is going to dictate this entire thing because he's Deion Sanders. That was his thing as a player. Okay. You know, he was a pioneer in free agency because he's like, I'm Deion. I'll go where I want to go. Okay, but think about it. So he's going to, what? He's going to shoehorn Shador oh, yeah. somewhere? Well, oh, the last yeah. person who did that didn't want to go to San Diego and wanted to go to New York. Warm two weather, rolls. cold weather. Well, bad organization, but okay. yeah. Okay, I'm De just saying. Uh, yeah, I think Deion's going to be that kind of parent for sure. Well, we can talk about that, but we don't know how the board's going to fall, who's going to be bad, like all of these things. 
things. And to just say, so you want to play where? The Carolina Panthers because the weather's mild? That's well, so I, short-sighted. I think it's also Chicago. I think okay, that... Okay, that's, that's a different thing. Yeah. They do well, not I don't have a think track it's totally record different of thing. developing I th- a quarterback. I think it's a combination. I mean, one of the reasons is it's cold in Chicago. It's hard and it's windy. And quarterbacks hate wind. It's, you know, it, you might even call it the Windy City. <laughs> Thank you, bro. And they're right there by the water. I, I do think that there's a lot of logic to okay, what he says. Okay, but Green Bay could go from, uh, they're going from one first ballot Hall of Famer to a second first ballot Hall of Famer, and I think a lot of people are expecting no. big things from Jordan Love this year. To say that cold weather, it, it's just, it's so lame from Dion, and I'm surprised because he's all about, you know, not making excuses, and this is a huge one. Uh, I don't know. I want to see, <laughs> I'm with him. I want to see Caleb Williams go somewhere warm and throw 45 touchdowns. That's not happening in Chicago. Well, the other part is I just want to point this out because I'm sure there's some people who are listening in their car who are probably like, guys, sh- you know, and shaking their fist at us. Caleb Williams is from Washington, D.C. It's not yeah. Chicago cold, but it's not Miami. <laughs> like, he has grown up in cold weather. Again, Oklahoma, uh, you will experience cold weather. And he's been in he's been in L.A. the shortest amount. Uh, if you consider his life, he was there for two seasons. One season in Oklahoma and grew up in Washington, D.C. Like, the fact that he couldn't play in the cold or you wouldn't want him to is is crazy. You're saying something that the, that the guy's not even saying. Yeah, but if you had a choice as a Caleb Williams fan, which I am, don't you want to see him indoors? That'd be amazing. I, 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 I'm I, still worried that Chicago is going to gut the Caleb Williams experience. Well, they might because we've never seen them be able to do this. But just because the cold weather, that's mm. not why. Jay Cutler could still throw the ball. I mean, they had a lot of other issues, but throwing in the cold weather wasn't one of them. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just totally get it. It's, I don't think it's – he wouldn't say the same thing if Green Bay was sitting at number one. I think it was partly because of Chicago – Dion knows the league really well, and I guarantee he's gonna he's going to dictate where Shador Sanders goes. Well, we can I, have that conversation, but here's the other part about he, this. Cold by the way, weather he's thing. not sending if Shador if he's not going to Buffalo, he's not going to Chicago. Yeah, I think Dion really believes that, and I don't think he's alone. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Yes, Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes have kicked butt in the cold. Same with Tom Brady. Yeah, Mahomes is Brady. minus thirty. <laughs> but you at least. At least there is a logic to what he's saying. It's not totally out of left field. I I just think there's no logic to it because it. If you are a good quarterback in this league, which means you're going to be playing in multiple playoff games, and unless you have home field advantage, which case you could be playing in a cold weather city, it'll be cold. You're going to have to play in a cold game. That's just the, that's where the cities are. Just okay, the Super Bowl you might not, but the playoffs you're going to. So why would you run from it? I don't know. I'd rather be indoors. I'd rather go to Minnesota or Detroit or. All these, I, I, I personally, if I was a quarterback, if I was Kirk Cousins or somebody, I would want to play in a controlled environment. It, it, given my choice, I mean, Drew Brees' and Peyton Manning's numbers through their career, I think a big part of that success was playing indoors. It might be. You have to take it into account. But Jared Goff, look at him outside compared to indoors. I, I think you probably get a 10% bump playing indoors for your career. You know, yeah, maybe. I think Drew Brees, definitely there's something to it. I think for Peyton, definitely there's something to it. Although, you know, Peyton definitely had an MVP season in Denver um, also. I, I think also your style of play, now that we're talking it out, depends. I don't think Peyton and Drew Brees and Kirk Cousins have the arm strength of Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. Uh, Caleb's got a huge arm strength, but for some reason he feels like kind of uh, not a cold-weather quarterback to me. And that's based on nothing. You're right, he's from D.C., but he doesn't. he feels... More like a kind of a high volume passing, good weather quarterback. Yeah, but his biggest comp is to Mahomes, who plays yeah. in really cold and windy and every kind of weather possible. Feels like is in Kansas City. Yeah, I don't know. The other thing about Kirk Cousins is Kirk Cousins played in D.C., so you're playing against the NFC East, and that's where he really and he played at Michigan State, obviously, which is freezing. But you know, played in the NFC East, so you're playing outside in Philly, yeah. you're playing outside in New York. <laughs> But Kirk All Cousins made, games. Kirk Cousins is a brilliant, brilliant salary guy, and he went to Minnesota where his numbers were going to be huge, and now he's going to Atlanta indoors. I, If I'm a quarterback, I definitely want to be a warm-weather guy. I mean, Tua, you think Tua's going to play in the cold? Look at him. We, he froze out there. And I think that's a problem. I, I think it's a problem for Miami. When it might you, be a problem for the teams, but the quarterbacks, given a choice, if you had an open free agency, I think they would take the warm weather and the indoor stadiums first. The thing is about cold weather, though, I truly believe this. It's not just because I'm from a cold place. It is something you can get used to playing in. Tom Brady's mm-hmm. from California and had this incredible career in New England with a lot of those being home games in January. You can so if Tua actually went to a cold weather team, maybe he'd be a little bit better in cold weather. 
Because True. you do get used to it. You get coping mechanisms. Brady wore the scuba suit underneath his uniform. You find out what works for you. Tom Brady won a ton in the cold. His, his cold numbers are, but I'm sure his stats went down. So at least from a production standpoint, I think in cold weather, I mean, I remember the Josh Allen versus Mac Jones where Mac Jones threw three passes. Yeah. You're not going to get those games if you're in L.A. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, but that was a 50-mile-an-hour win game. Like, that was yeah. an anomaly anyway. It was an anomaly, but I do think that you're going to just have better stats in, in warm weather. And that's Dion is looking out for Shador. We're going to have this same conversation next year. I'll bet you. Man. It's going to be some cold-weather team up in the top three. And love Dion's going to say, no, thank you. I love to know that it's about stats and not about winning with Shador. Uh-oh. Uh, coming up, new quarterback introduced to a new team yesterday. Throwing some shade at his old team. It's all that next. Still move. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. minute remaining.
45 seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. He's been on the TB12 method since he was six. She's on her third scotch. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. We get a little more clarity on some quarterback situations going on in the NFL. Hey, welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. We get back to March Madness in just a moment. But Perloff, yesterday, uh, the backup quarterback for your football team, the Philadelphia Eagles, that is now Kenny Pickett. He was meeting the media yesterday. And, um... Well, tried to be forthcoming about how things mm. ended with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now that Pittsburgh is moving on with Russell Wilson and also Justin Fields. So let's hear a little from Kenny Pickett. Um, in his opinion, he handled Russ and the arrival and the departure from Pittsburgh. He handled that all perfectly. I think the communication, um, you know, is what it is. It was behind closed doors. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident in the way that I handled it. I handled it the way I should have handled it. Um, you know, I'm excited to be here. It, it, it worked out so well that Philly was the place I ended up landing in. So um, I think everything happens for a reason. And, you know, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. All right. Kenny Pickett says he's ready for a fresh start, of course. You know, I just thought it was time. You know, it just it just felt like it was time from, you know, the things that transpired and, um, you know, wanted to get a chance to, to, to go somewhere else and continue to grow my career. And the fact that it's in Philly, um, you know, the place that I grew up, you know, found the love for the game here. Okay. Uh, and finally, he wants to tell his side of the rumors that he refused to be a backup to Mason Rudolph when he was coming off of his ankle surgery. Hey, Kenny, there were some reports that you refused to be an emergency quarterback toward the end of the year last season. Can you tell us what happened there? Yeah, I think that goes back to a lot of the communication behind closed doors that, you know, didn't go the way that I feel like they went, how it was getting released. Um, you know, there was a plan there for that game. It went down exactly the way it was planned to go down that entire week. Um, you know, I was coming off the ankle surgery, so um, it is what it is. And Okay, so what I'm reading here from yeah. Kenny Pickett is that he feels like he was doing everything correctly mm -hmm. and that the Steelers are now trying to paint him like he was some kind of malcontent, right? Or is it the media? He's saying, what I read in that last thing was the media reported that he didn't want to dress where him and the team both knew that he wasn't going to dress. Well, why, he's talking about the communication behind the scenes, right? So he's saying the communication is how it, behind the scenes was one way, and then how it came out. That's right, kind of implying that the team leaked it, no? Well, yes, you're taking that leap that the team leaked it. I, You could argue that the media got it wrong, and that they were eager to believe that there was controversy there where it wasn't. So I don't think we know for sure. I mean... I kind of think that Kenny Pickett said, I don't want to go in as a backup. I kind of... I you think he did not want to go back in? I think, he, I think at the end of the day, he did not want to go back in. See, after hearing that, I don't think so. And I think P Pickett now has really been painted here because he did it's ask for a trade out. It looks like he did ask for a trade. If Russell Wilson's going to come in, this is obviously before Fields got traded there and the whole scenario changed again. But Russell Wilson's coming in. You didn't want to be the backup to Fields or to, to Wilson. That's a bad look to ask for a trade. I totally understand that. But the things leading up to it, I I think Pickett probably has has a gripe here. You know, he looks bad. He definitely looks yeah. bad. But doesn't he have a gripe? I mean, he is the number one, the the first round pick. Okay. He did get like an emergency surgery that was kind of like this thing called tightrope surgery to to, to come back quicker. Mm -hmm. Tua had this at one point, and then he 
does everything he can to come back, and they decide to stick with Mason Rudolph because he had the hot hand? Yeah, definitely. No, he doesn't have a gripe there. You got to you gotta do what's best for the team. And clearly, Mason Rudolph was playing better football than Kenny Pickett and giving him a better chance to win just based on his win-loss record. Of course the team was going to go. It would have been crazy to put Pickett in there. See, but it was already starting to look different with Pickett once they got Matt Canada that out of there. That was one game. I, okay, but we're going off of Deshaun Watson at one good half against the Ravens, and now we believe he could be back. You could have gotten on a roll here with Pickett and to show absolutely no faith in him. And I believe that the whole time Mason Rudolph was was going to come back. I think that's what Kenny Pickett's telling you. Listen, we had a plan the whole week, and I think it was I was coming off of surgery and I was not cleared, and I wasn't going to play. Yeah, I mean, Mason Rudolph won his last three games as a starter, so I, I just don't think there was anything the Steelers could have done because Kenny Pickett was hobbling around on off t- off tightrope surgery. To put him in would have been malpractice, and I think he had to understand that. I do understand. He probably said, hey, listen, I have a banged-up ankle. I'm not going to be the backup. If you want me to start, I'll do it, but I don't want to be the backup. I think there was It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Either but, you can play or you can't play. Now, back to this thing about him saying, I don't want to be a backup to Russell Wilson. Yeah. The, it's interesting. If the Steel, I have a question for you, Maggie. If the Steelers didn't have Justin Fields floating around out there, would they have held on to him anyway? Do you think that they knew they could get Fields and said, ooh, we like Fields more than Pickett? Because I think that was part of the calculus of this decision to trade him to Philly. Uh, I think there was always an interest in Fields. Yes. I don't. I do not think that that was a media invention. I think Mike Tomlin saying he liked Justin Fields, and yeah. I think Fields is going to end up playing more games this year than Russell Wilson. So I'm on record saying that I think Fields is going to end up being the big winner out of this whole thing and the whole situation in Pittsburgh. So yeah, that probably didn't make. Yeah. I, they were willing to move on from Pickett a little too easily, considering the first round grade they had on. Him. Yeah, and I'm of course. There's a multiple reports that the Eagles were hunting around Justin Fields as well. I'm very frustrated that he's not an Eagle. I would take him over Kenny Pickett. Well, of course. But here's the other part of this. You know, Mike Tomlin, part of the reason why they loved Kenny Pickett, right, because he was in the building. That was the thing. He was at Pitt. He was in the building. They shared mm. the practice facility, all of that. If if this doesn't work out here with Russell Wilson and or Justin Fields, yeah. and if the Steelers, because you don't think it's going to, you think this is more of the same bargain shopping for these two quarterbacks doesn't solve the problems that the Steelers have. It's right. not a meaningful upgrade, right? Yeah, I don't I put think words in your be, mouth, but that's yeah. I mean, they're going to be ten and seven again. So work out, define work out. Yeah, they're going to have a, a win playoff win. game. Yeah, I, I still think they're in that playoff limbo. I don't think that that they're getting over the top with this move. Okay, so how much of that does come back on Mike Tomlin? Because again, Mike Tomlin is, I think, has a lot of power in the organization. Yeah. And I know Kevin Colbert was there at the very end, their GM, and was technically the one who selected Pickett. But I think Tomlin, I don't think a lot happens there without his sign off. I don't think someone else is picking out the groceries and he's making the meal to sure. quote Bill Parcells. Okay, so they were willing to move on from Pickett in two years. Yeah, I mean, it's a failure. It's a failure Here's to a develop t- him. It's a it was a failure all the way. Whatever you think about Pickett, yeah. it's a it was a failure that the Bears did develop Justin Fields. It's a failure that the Steelers did not develop Pickett. How much does Tomlin have to wear that if this doesn't work out? I mean, if he goes ten and seven again with this crew, how do you? You're never going to fire Mike Tomlin if he keeps having winning records. He's got to he's got to have a losing season before you fire him, right? That, in my opinion, it'd be insane to fire a future Hall of Famer coming off a nine and eight or ten and seven record. So who cares if they they took a you know that's a flyer a number twenty to take Kenny Pickett. That's not the number one overall pick. No, I don't think this fail this failure is a blip for the Steelers. To me, it's not. He wasn't Trevor Lawrence. He was Kenny Pickett. And honestly, if the Steelers didn't take him at twenty. He might fall into the second round. I think history is not going to kill them for this. Is this one of the all time flops? Can you be a bust if you're number twenty? Uh, I mean, not like an, an all-time, all-time flop. Boss. I mean, it's not like, you know, Ryan or Leaf or, you know, someone like that. And no, it's not an all-time flop. But at the same time, I think it's wor- it looks so much worse on the Steelers because you had this institutional knowledge about Pickett. You liked him because yeah. he was in your backyard. You felt like you knew him. You should know him better than anybody. There's no surprises here. You're passing the guy in the hallway all the but time. But the main problem was they also knew Matt Canada. Is, is Pittsburgh, <laughs> hired him Pittsburgh too. Panthers offensive coordinator and hired him. You know, the thing about you also, you can't call Kenny. I'm looking at Kenny Pickett's record. He's 14 and 10 as a starter. So even that, I mean, I understand they won a lot of these games 17 10 or whatever, but that's not bust material at all. I think Kenny Pickett's in this weird place. Or we don't know where he is. And the other thing, too, the Eagles have resuscitated careers before. Maybe he had, he'll be judged from his second run. No, I don't, I don't see... I he's going to play for the Eagles. Ooh. 
Really? Interesting. No, I'm assuming that Jalen Hurts is going to be... Jalen Hurts... Whatever knee issue is going to get fixed this offseason, and I think he's going to go into the season healthy. Jalen Hurts, how old is he? 26? He plays like he is 42 years old. I think that Jalen Hurts will have some time on the bench this year for injuries. I just think that if Jalen Hurts uh, keeps on, wants to get mobile again like he was two years ago, and I think there's some pressure to do that, that's a situation. Mobile quarterbacks, you know, they get hurt. Lamar Jackson has got hurt. Backups play. By week 15, we're going to have 20 backups in the in the games all over. Why not Kenny Pickett? He'll get out there, Maggie. He, he's inevitable. <laughs> Kenny <laughs> Pickett is going to... I think, I mean, listen, this is a franchise that had Nick Foles win a Super Bowl. Backup quarterbacks are a big deal in Philly. They always get on the field. Yeah, and how did that work out for the starter when Nick Foles won a Super Bowl? Carson Wentz was out of there. Poof. Gone. Two years later, after he signed the richest contract in NFL history, I they did not. Nick Foles was the one who went away. Then Carson Wentz signed a contract, and then I don't know what happened. He won another playoff. He got to the playoffs the next year. I think that Jalen Hurts should uh, look at history there and be a little nervous about this move. Would you be shocked if Kenny Pickett took over at some point because Hurts was nicked up and played well? I would not. Feels like that's the way the NFL works. 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. All right, so we got Kenny Pickett's side of things yesterday. Kind of led to some questions. I think this puts more on Mike Tomlin. You know, it just feels like Pickett's telling his side of the story. And while Pickett might not be the perfect narrator here, he's kind of painting it out like the organization is... um, whether they're leaking the stories, they're not doing enough to clean mm. up the leak or to, uh, to help him... Um, if they're if they're not leaking the stories, then the organization's not doing enough to de- like denounce the stories, if you will, or right. to say like, hey, this isn't true or whatever. I think they're they're letting him twist. But I the reality of the situation, they have Russell Wilson and Justin Fields in yeah. that building right now. No it's one's going to be thinking about Kenny Pickett. They're going to get every single headline there is. Russ and Justin Fields. This is going to be the closest watch quarterback battle of the off season. I think Kenny Pickett's going to be a distant memory by August. Yeah, I think this is going to work in Pittsburgh. By the way. I do like it. As much as I'm saying Tomlin on the hot seat, and this or not on the hot seat, but Tomlin has to wear this, that Kenny Pickett never developed, and all of that, I do think that this situation is going to work. And I think it's going to work with Fields. Kenny Pickett is being kind of painted as this villain or this guy who's soft, who didn't want to work for it. I mean, I don't know. If you're him, you're a first-round pick. The team put their belief in you when you went out on the field. You saved the first season when you went out there. That was going to be, if Mr. Trubisky continued starting, that would have been a five-win season. They actually won some games when he went out there. Then last year, you were, yes, the numbers weren't great, but you were winning games. If I'm him, I don't feel like I should just be relegated to the bench as soon as Russell Wilson comes in. What has Russell Wilson won in the last two years? He went to a team with Super Bowl expectations, and they couldn't wait to get rid of him. I have high expectations for Russell Wilson, but I, I do feel like this 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 idea that Kenny Pickett is being painted as some like diva yeah. because he was being relegated for the to the bench without an opportunity to actually co- really compete for the starting job. Because as soon as they signed Russ, it was he's the starter, yes. Pickett's the backup. I get why he would want to go out, and I, I don't I don't know if it's fair to, to to paint him as some villain because he wanted to leave. Now, the whole benching thing, that was a whole different thing with Mason Rudolph. But the fact that he wanted to leave Pittsburgh, I don't, I don't, I think that it's unfair he's being, he's being painted the way he is. I mean, I think the NFL spoke on Kenny Pickett. He was, he was traded for a fourth, third round pick swap. He's not a lot of value. I don't think anybody was that interested in Kenny Pickett. I think he's already viewed in the Mac Jones territory, right? It's yeah. kind of a similar trade. Uh, I, I think Matt, I, I don't think Kenny Pickett, if he w- thought he was a starter, how come nobody wanted him to start? That's the question. I it, think the NFL said, nah, we're not seeing it. it. I'll tell you what, if we just zoom out for a second, a lot of whiffs going on lately with these quarterbacks. I mean, I know CJ Stroud is coming off of the great rookie season, uh, maybe one of the best we'll ever see, but Bryce Young so far has been not good. Yeah. We can look at that whole 2022 draft outside right. of Trevor Lawrence, who he is also not exactly blossomed into what we thought Trevor Lawrence is going to be yet, but Trey Lance, Zach Wilson, Mac Jones. Now you go back another yeah. year with Kenny Pickett. It has been a lot of whiffs, which kind of has me thinking about this quarterback class and how many surefire things do we really have in this year's quarterback? Right. You know, with, we, we think maybe five, six could go in the first round. Well, because of the rookie salary cap there, you can easily afford to miss on a first round quarterback. That's why the, you know, once they got, you used to pay Sam Bradford $50 million on his first contract. Those days are gone. You can easily pick a quarterback at 17. I still think it's worth the risk. Why not take a flyer on Bo Nix at 30 
instead of letting him fall to another team or even the second round. Because if it doesn't work out, who cares? Just move on. Look at San Francisco. San Francisco is the ultimate example. They blew it on Trey Lance, and boom, they're in overtime in the Super Bowl. It just doesn't hurt people anymore. Yeah, I think the San Francisco example, though, is like they just – I thought they got so lucky here. They got so lucky. I mean, Mr. Irrelevant comes and saves their behind. Shanahan would have found someone else. It did not matter. But who? That's a system. Like, you go out with, with guys like Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy G, I mean. Who gets hurt. Jimmy G has no value in the league right now, and he got that dude to the Super Bowl. No, I know, but you're, but that's an imperfect. Like, I thought Shanahan, the 49ers, got so lucky with Brock Purdy. They mm. can say they've been scouting him all that. They had all those rounds to take him and waited until Mr. Irrelevant. I mean, if if the 49ers, if that Trey Lance thing had blown up even worse, I think we're not looking at it as like, oh, you know, just take mm. a flyer. I, and mean, I think those po- quarterbacks we mentioned outside of the 49ers situation, those situations were all in chaos with those first-round picks that didn't work out. But they were in chaos before that first-round pick. I mean, the Patriots lost Tom Brady. They were already behind the eight ball. They had to take a flyer on somebody. Right, but there wasn't this idea that Bill Bill Belichick was going to get fired in a couple of years. I mean, we he beat out Cam Newton right, for the yeah, job. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it was supposed to. I mean, the the Jets situation. Everybody's on the hot seat. Like, I, I don't know if it was necessarily. Now, those guys were a little higher than Kenny Pickett was, but to be fair, like the Pittsburgh Steelers had a much better team, so maybe right. for them it's not as big a risk. But I think for most teams, still, if you drive the first round quarterback and it goes terribly, you, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster. The Bears got lucky because the Panthers were stupid enough to <laughs> right. take another bad first-round quarterback. But the counter is if you pass on a first-round quarterback, it could also be a disaster. Washington not taking Justin Herbert was a huge mistake. For sure. I think it was Herbert. They took Chase Young instead. Yeah, so it's there's no perfect science here. I, I say over-invested quarterback. Draft him, draft him, draft him. I don't need a safety in the second round if I can have a quarterback. Just get as many guys in the building. What's wrong with that? That's what the great teams do. Bill Belichick kept drafting quarterbacks with Tom Brady. He did Jimmy G in the second round. Ryan Mallett was second or third round. So if those guys keep on getting guys, I don't know what's wrong with the little competition, Maggie, having a guy breathing over the shoulder to motivate the starter. My problem is not with the competition. My problem is with the evaluation. I mean, it just feels like there's so many things in sports that are getting better and better. We know so much more and all this information. And the quarterback stuff is still this huge mystery. Like, you can go to the S2 test, the wonder lick, the combine, the pro days, the private investigators going back to kindergarten to try to see what these dudes are all about. It doesn't matter. We've got all the information in the world, mm. and this still has not – we still are no closer – to figuring out what makes a good quarterback and what doesn't. It's wow. wild to me. Everything in sports gets better and gets more fine-tuned, and yet the quarterback stuff is still such a crapshoot. I don't, I mean, there are a lot of number one picks making Pro Bowls. I mean, look at the 2020 draft. It was Burrow 1, 2 at 2, Justin Fields 3, Jordan Love 4. Four first-rounders are all Pro Bowlers. So they that was 4 for 4, and then Jalen Hurts was the fifth quarterback. I think it goes year by year. Teams are sort of, you get lucky or you don't get lucky. Like last year's class was not very strong, wasn't very deep. So they had to, you know, I don't think they wanted to take Bryce Young number one. I mean, they, they traded up to get him. I they say, traded up with him in mind. Don't it, let them off the hook. In the sense that I think they would have rather had a draft where Caleb Williams was there. But they, they looked at this draft and said, oh, CJ Stroud's from Ohio State. They've all failed. Bryce Young seems to be the best guy, but they would have been pretty psyched if it was a Caleb Williams draft. You know, there's just different drafts or different things. Remember the year that the Jets were tanking? Uh, who were they tanking for? Trevor, right? Yep. Uh, like, that's a year you want to be a draft. Last year, nobody... They ended up with Zach Wilson. They forced it. They traded up from 9-1, to one, but it, we all knew last year was not a strong quarterback draft, right? I mean... <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, I, there was Bryce a lot Young. of Bryce Young supporters. You think Bryce Young was viewed the same way Caleb Williams is viewed this year? Well, not Caleb, but he had the same, basically the same stuff as Caleb. It, it, like, he had the Heisman. He didn't have the physical tools, obviously. But I was the one who was very question. I was very skeptical about Bryce Young. And I got called a hater every which way but Sunday. Yeah. But, I mean, Caleb Williams, people have been talking about for three years. And teams were tanking for Caleb Williams. Nobody was tanking for Bryce Young. That That's the way it played out. I mean, I, I don't think, uh, you know, there was no... What, what is the expression? Uh, you always have tank for Tua. Suck for luck. Yeah. Suck for luck. There was no be bad for Bryce. 
I, I don't. I know, but you still have a team that traded all the way up from nine to one and traded their best receiver and their next year's number one pick for the, Bryce Young. And you look at the class. I mean, you're talking about three quarterbacks taking yeah. in the first four picks. This was not the Kenny Pickett class where you're talking about the first quarterback just taking his twenty. Yeah, it, but it is not this year's class. It is night and day different. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm getting skeptical about this class. To be oof. honest with you, you got Caleb Williams, uh, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, Bo Nix, and Michael Penix. Compared to Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, and Anthony Richardson, I I will take this class ten times out of ten. There, guys, Drake May has been the NFL has been salivating over Drake May for since his freshman year. I, I know I, it seems like everyone just takes the tape from his last season and wants to throw it out. Yeah, I I don't think Bryce I don't think the Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, Anthony Richardson class is anywhere near this. Yes, they did go high, but they are. I bet you, long run, this class is way more productive. Well, but Stroud is already off to a pretty good start. Yeah. You're picking them to go to the Super Bowl, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. No, Stroud's, <laughs> right. ama- Stroud's amazing. But I think there's there's multiple Pro Bowls, Bowlers in this class, for sure. 855-212-4CBS. 855-212-4227. Guess what? Perloff goes against the grain. Next. Don't move. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One 
one minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Big debate here on Maggie and Pearl Off Show. First round quarterbacks. You kill a team if they miss. We're going to get to it against the grain in a moment where we'll discuss this. But listen, for every Zach Wilson and Trey Lance, there's a Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert. So it's not all bad in the first round. Just saying. Yeah, this is uh, specifically about the Steelers and how much do they have to wear the fact that Kenny Pickett Okay, didn't want to compete with Russell Wilson. You want to, you know, chastise him for that? Fine. But they did nothing really for Pickett. This was a lot of the playbook of how you don't develop a quarterback. To be honest, the Chicago Bears with Justin Fields, too. Switching offensive yeah. coordinators, switching coaches a lot. You know, the instability, not having good pieces around. I yeah. guess the Steelers had better pieces around Pickett, but you know what I mean. But if you ever read one of those Mike Sando anonymous GM pieces, there's a lot of skepticism about Kenny Pickett. There are a lot of people who don't think Kenny Pickett's a good quarterback. I mean, no that's doubt. the bottom line. Uh, let's go to the phones. Bill's in California. Wants to talk about first-round quarterbacks. Hey, Bill, how are you? Good morning, Maggie. Perloff, how are you guys doing this morning? We're great. How are you? Good. Hey, Perloff, I'm still waiting for that call for the RV ride, just letting you know. Oh, oh, Bill. You know, it's funny. Because of March Madness and everything, we got our One Hit Wonders bracket going on. We've got our Pearl Jam Season 3 bracket. We got WrestleMania coming up, which is a whole big thing. We've kind of put the Pearl off road trip to San Antonio a bit on the back burner. Well, we're not sure. I mean, yes, Wemby's basically averaging a triple double this month and 30 points and winning games. <laughs> yeah. But it's not uh, over yet for Rookie of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be driving hey. to San Antonio to apologize to Wemby, no doubt. Hey, this is my question to you guys as the media. Yeah. If the, if these first rounders, you know, uh, be it that it's Fields or Jones or Wilson or any of these guys that were up there, if they were playing for Kyle Shanahan and they did what you know good like Brock Purdy this year, would you guys be saying, oh, that's where he's supposed to be? That's where, or would you be saying he's a system quarterback? Because that's what you called Brock Purdy as a system quarterback, right. and he's a good quarterback because he wasn't a first rounder. You guys call him a system quarterback. Now, would you have the same quotations on these first-rounders if they were playing for Kyle Shanahan? Yeah. I mean, listen, you want to ask that question to Andrew Perloff, who called Tom Brady a system quarterback. <laughs> I think that uh, Perloff in the system, there's no end. Like, everyone's part of the system, in your opinion. First round, sixth yeah. round, greatest of all time, biggest flop, doesn't matter. I think it is wrong to say Patrick Mahomes will be Patrick Mahomes without Andy Reid. I think everybody, it's a very, very team sport. It's the most team sport of all the four major American sports because there's so many dudes on the field. I think you have to be a great team guy, a quarterback, and I think you need a great coach. Any co There are coaches, Matt Cannon could have ruined anybody. I, I don't think there's any quarterback that can overcome the worst play caller in the league. Honestly, I think Arthur Smith could probably ruin anybody, so we'll see. He's the guy to develop Justin Fields. We'll see about that. I, that's why I'm more skeptical than you about the Steelers. So I do think system is a big deal. Now the question, Trey Lance, I think it's the, was he talking about Trey Lance? I was a little confused. Trey Lance, yeah. Zach Wilson, any of the first rounders. If they had succeeded, would we have called them a system it's quarterback? Still. I think Trey Lance, we might have because Trey Lance had no college success. So we didn't know him in any other, <laughs> what system. other system. I mean, he had success, but we didn't see it because it was North Dakota State. Now you and I will always disagree about Mahomes. I think if you had put Mahomes on another team, he's still Mahomes. And I know Andy Reid is a great coach, but 
the reason why they say Travis Kelsey is still open after all these years is because they're just doing backyard football. They're not even, it's like a lot of times this isn't even plays. At least that's how they're making it seem to the outside. Like, hey, we just say, Travis, go get open. That's just two athletes making making plays. To me, that's not the system. So, I, so I th- but how do you explain that Andy Reid's had success with every quarterback? I think he's a good coach. I'm not taking away, but my question is, would Patrick Mahomes thrive outside of Andy Reid? Would he be chasing Tom Brady? I think so. I do. Oh, no way. If the Jets had taken him at six that year with Jamal, they took Jamal Adams. Yeah. There is no way he is on the heels of the GOAT with three Super Bowl rings. Listen, this is why quarterbacks change fortunes. I don't think anyone Mm. was looking at the Cincinnati Bengals and saying that they were going to be in a Super Bowl or perennial contenders and Joe Burrow goes there, and everything is different. And I, I just, I, I do think quarterbacks have that much of an influence. Wow. <laughs> okay. I mean, say the Bears are taking Mahomes over Trubisky. That's not happening either. I, I just completely disagree. Well, with I you. think Caleb Williams is going to turn around the Bears. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know if he's, he's not going to be as good as Mahomes. I think that's probably, but his biggest comp is Mahomes. And we're literally going to get to test this in real time. At some point, every. Every quarterback, every team's fortunes do change off of a quarterback. The Bills, their fortunes have changed. They haven't won yeah. yet, but they are now relevant. I think if Deshaun Watson actually played how he how we thought he was going to play, like he did in Houston, I think the Bears finally, or excuse me, the Browns would yeah. have finally had their quarterback. I think the Bears could have a chance. Yeah. I, do you think if Josh Allen was a quarterback of the Chiefs, he'd have a ring yet? I do, and I think that yes, if, that's and what I, I mean. And I think if Patrick Mahomes was on the Bills, I think they would have a ring. Maybe one, but there's no okay, way. I'm That's telling what I'm saying. You. Josh Allen doesn't have a ring in Buffalo, but right. if you put him in that system in Kansas City, he has a ring. And so I'm that... telling you that Mahomes was in Buffalo with Sean McDermott. I still think they win. Ooh. Maybe. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I think Mahomes would be successful anywhere. I think he's one he of those He might guys. be successful, but I think I, I I think you can marry the two together. You could say Belichick and Brady were successful together. Reed and Mahomes are successful together. They're not. Th- he's not winning three Super Bowls in Chicago. I mean, that's uh, a lot of Super Bowls, It's a Maggie. lot of Super Bowls. I mean, yeah, we, he's it's not the not first. Many, re- yeah, listen, is. the other thing, too, is just how special this Mahomes thing is. I, I don't think you can underestimate that. That's and I true. think it has a lot to do with Reed. The whole thing works together. How did we even it's get... It's funny oh. about Bill's call. Yeah. I, it's funny, though, because I think up until a year, two years ago, a lot of people believed it was Brady and Belichick together yeah. that did this. Pull people now. Yeah, but I think in 10 years, they'll... they'll okay. Right now, it feels like Brady... Pull people now. Yeah. You, Who's more responsible for the dynasty? And I bet it'd be a landslide right now with Brady over Belichick. Right, but Brady himself said, if I got drafted by Arizona, this none of this happened. Right. and Which is and, fact. And, and right, it does. But Patrick Mahomes was a first-round pick. Brady was a sixth-round pick. There's so many more valuables. Patrick Mahomes, no matter oh, where man. he was going, was, was drafted to be the starter. Brady was drafted to be a glorified tackling dummy. Which, ironically, he's... Patrick Mahomes didn't start his rookie year, but uh, the teams around the if another team had taken, if he had gone to Houston with Bill O'Brien to think that that team was going to win three Super Bowls with what was going on in that building, no way. I, don't I mean, know. they Kansas had basically City, just, let's let's not pay Kansas City like they were this be- you know the the culture there was so beautiful and great. I this was a, only a couple years before they had one of the biggest tragedies that happened in the entire NFL. How, Th- this was not and listen, I I just I think Mahomes did this. You could say Reed too. I'm I'm giving Reed credit. I'm just giving more credit to Mahomes. I don't know. Mahomes took over a pretty darn good team in Kansas City. What were they? Eleven and five. Yeah, the year no, that... he got drafted to a good spot. I just I think his talent is so good he would have overcome it. Also, listen, I think Andy Reed, he's a great offensive coach. He's a great coach, but he farms out the defense. It's not like, you know, he's one of these coaches that's uh, you know, the CEO. I mean, he is a CEO, but that he's just sort of overlording and John Harbaugh type of thing. He just lets Steve Spagnuolo do what he wants. Right, but he, okay, but uh, he makes quarterbacks great. That's that's my take. And he didn't make Mahomes great. Mahomes was going to be great anywhere, There's but he point. really took him to the next level. Okay, but you just said what I've been saying. Mahomes would have been great anywhere. You literally said yeah, it yeah but he wouldn't be, he would be chasing Tom Brady. He wouldn't be an, all, you know, this all time, probably first or second for sure, all time greatest quarterback. I don't think that's happening if he goes to Chicago. I think he's closer to Josh Allen. Mm. Uh, Peter Schwartz is here. Hello, Peter. How are you? I am doing well. Good morning. Blake Smell. Uh, Blake Snell. Blake Snell finally ha- smells because he's not a Yankee. Blake Snell finally has a home. The Giants and the free agent lefty have reportedly agreed on a two year, $62 million deal. The reigning National League Cy Young Award winner has an opt out in the contract after the first season. Now to the NBA, and we'll begin in Salt Lake City. Top of the key, Ant rises, free throw line, jumper hits it! 
He is money. A monster fourth quarter with 11 points. He's 5 of 5 shooting. He's got 23 in the second half. That was Alan Horton on T Wolves Radio. T Wolves over the Jazz, 114 104. Anthony Edwards, 32 points, eight assists, seven rebounds. Or earlier in the show, you were talking about the Warriors struggling and losing some faith in them, right? So they did yeah. lose to the Knicks last night, 119 112. A big problem for the Warriors this year has been their play at home. Last night dropped them to 17 and 18 at the Chase Center, and that was something that head coach Steve Kerr talked about last night. It's always important to, to control your home floor. Um, this has been a strange season in that regard. We've been good at home for a long time and um, just haven't been able to establish um, – you know that uh, that dominance at home, and that's what's keeping us from, you know, climbing up in the standings. Wasn't it just last season that the Warriors were terrible on the road? Yep. <laughs> why? Why did things flip flop so quickly? It's, it's amazing how they can't win at home. It's 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 dumbfounding. But I, uh, again, I think this is what happens to older teams who are over the hill. But you think the home would be a good thing? You know? I know, but I think I think when we talk about you know why are teams inconsistent? It's like well. They're consistently inconsistent. Like they are who they are. Like yeah. this is this is who the Warriors are going to be. I think year in and year out until they make some kind of massive changes. I don't know what they are. I don't think it has anything to do with getting rid of Kerr or Curry. But I think everyone else, if I'm looking at that roster, major overhauls got to come. Well, they just extended Draymond, so he's not going anywhere. Which was stupid. And Clay, we'll see. I think they need height. I mean, not to be so obvious. I know the league got small. But do they have a prayer if they ever saw the Nuggets in the playoffs? I mean, how are no. they going to guard Gordon Porter and Jokic? So, and they have Kaminga, but is Kaminga that tall? I mean, Kaminga is six seven. I mean, he's a yeah. small forward. I yeah, mean, they, I, I, they and you know, remember they used to early on they had Andrew Bogut, and yep. I feel like that tall center was kind of important to the team, even though he wasn't one of the stars. They, they, I agree with you guys. They seem to be built kind of funny right now. Uh, I still, I love your your last dance thing. Yeah. Uh, but Steph, Steph seems a little ageless. I feel like there could be another dance coming. <laughs> another they build last a team, dance? They build a team around him. Maybe we have that in two years. No, I can't keep calling last dances, though. That's kind of like a one. I can't be like, all right, I was wrong about the last dance this year. Next year is really the last dance. <laughs> when your star is 35. Not, if they're the 10 seed, it's not over. The Lakers got, what were the Lakers last year? They got to the they conference final. They were 7 seed. They were so, 7? So uh, they, like, that's the thing, like, those teams, the Warriors and the Lakers, they were much better last year than they are this year. Like, I know Kiwi Hugo is saying, well, they're in the play-in, so maybe they have a shot. Like, the Lakers and Warriors would have made the playoffs had they been – if we didn't have a play-in tournament. Like, those teams still would have been in. Right. So this is not a – we're not – we're talking about them in the ninth and tenth seed. We went to the one through eight. They wouldn't even be in the conversation. So th- this is th- – these teams aren't that good. I'm sorry. Wait, wait, the, Lakers, to everybody. the Lakers are pretty similar to last year. You think they're way different? Last year they ended up at 43 and 39. They're going to have a better record this year. I think they're pretty good. They made all but the, the changes. I think the, the, I think the yeah. Western. I think so. I think yeah, compared they were to the rest of the Western Conference. Yeah. I think they're they're not they're not on par with these other teams. Yeah. I think that's the difference. I because you're right. They're going to have a better record this year. But the and, competition is too good. But like, Davis last year, the played. West was 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 right for the taking, and they took it to their credit. Yeah, and Anthony Davis is a little better this year, so I think that's he's kind of been an MVP player. I, I still both those teams, Golden State and Lakers. Do you really want to play them? We talk about them like they're dead. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh, I'm the uh, I'm the young Minnesota T Wolves or the Thunder, uh, and you got Curry or LeBron on the other I side. I think if I was playing the Lakers, I'd be worried. I, I I'm not worried about this Warriors team. I think <laughs> them <laughs> stick a fork in them. I like this from Delta Nines in the chat. YouTube.com slash CBS Sports Radio. Twitch.tv slash CBS Sports Radio. It's the second to last dance. <laughs> and I don't even know. <laughs> I don't think you can call that, but I appreciate the bailout. Is there what, any uh, avenue for the Warriors, I know Carlos mentioning height, and I think that's part of it. But I also think they need like a real second scorer. Like they went and got Chris Paul, who well, in theory they thought maybe could give Steph Curry more opportunities to shoot, but he's already got a million opportunities to shoot. I don't know if that really was what they really needed. They need a second guy. Like Clay's on the decline. Andrew Wiggins, it just it doesn't not going like, happen. It just doesn't seem like he's been right since whatever happened last year happened to him. Yeah, they don't have a second. Score and that's the problem. All these I, teams that I'm looking at at the top of the West, they all got two guys who can take over games. I think it's the James Wiseman thing. It did not that's who they needed. They needed their Jaron Jackson Jr. They needed another star who yeah. was a front court player, and it just didn't work out. Although he's on my Pistons now, right? So <laughs> I, I can root for him. But a few things went wrong. And also, is Kuminga a star? That that is he's the most mysterious player. 
I can, I can no longer stay up late enough to watch him. He's so talented, but, but he's not that guy. But You're right. They need a second. Wait, hold on. Start. But didn't they trade James Wiseman and win the title? Yeah, they did. Right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but, well, no, but, but, but as still... far as sustaining success for a long time, they kind of needed, they had all those high draft picks. He yeah. was a number two pick, and you thought they were building a sort of uh, second dynasty, and it, it's not happening. What else we got? Other, the... other games last night, Lakers beat the Hawks, 136-105. D'Angelo Russell with 27 points. He had the Celtics over the Pistons, 119-94. 76ers beat the Heat, 98-91. The Bulls over the Blazers, 110-107. 107. Now to baseball. Sammy Sosa back in Chicago this past weekend for an autograph signing. It was his first time back in the Windy City since his career came to an end in 2007. He did take a moment to speak with the local Fox affiliate in Chicago, and he is hoping that one day soon he could make amends with the Cubs. Well, like I say, you know, I'm a mature man. Uh, I, th- I, you know, I think that uh, it's a possibility that we can do that. I'm open. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, I have, like I said, I have a lot of misunderstanding in the past, but now I'm a, I'm, I'm a real man. I feel great. So I recognize my mistake. So, hey, why not? So he talked about a misunderstanding in the past. So now came the follow-up question. Are you telling me that you recognize the fact that maybe you did do steroids? Um, <laughs> this is, um, like I say, um, this is, um, um, oh, not great. a question that I expect him from you. And then Sosa cut <laughs> the interview short. So he said he's a, a changed man, he's matured, and then he didn't want to answer that question. How do you not expect that question? Well, you say that uh, I realize I made mistakes I and know. that maybe I should do something. I do never underestimate the level of delusion for any athlete or famous person, especially someone of the caliber of Sosa, the star power. Here, Here's a... In some ways, I kind of feel like whatever's going on between him and the owner of the Cubs, who was not the owner of the Cubs when he was, you know, a star there, can this get done behind closed doors? Why does this have to be so public? The guy doesn't want to admit that he's done steroids. You either care about Sammy Sosa at this point or you don't. Whether he rec- like makes amends with the team that, to me, doesn't have to be public. The, the Cubs fans aren't demanding an apology. Tom Ricketts is demanding an apology from Sosa. Like, I don't know. Is there a Cub fan out there? Don't they just want to – can they just let the sleeping dog lie? Don't, don't the Cardinal fans still love Mark McGuire? Mm-hmm. And don't fans still love guys who tested positive? Why does this have to be so public to me is the question. I mean, just move on. I mean, That's what I'm I mean, asking. It's like, you know, if he's part of the team's history, it's not like – look, he – I, obviously, he did something incredibly stupid and wrong. Although it led to a golden age of of baseball yeah, that brought them back from the strike, or whatever right. percentage but, was also but, doing. But it. the point being is that you know the the Yankees still you know acknowledge Alex Rodriguez. The Red listen, Poppy Big Poppy's in the Hall of Fame, so the Red Sox still acknowledge you know David Ortiz. So just you know move along. But I, I but how how could he have not known that question was coming? I agree oh. with EJ. Like that's. That makes it a hundred <laughs> well, times worse. Yeah, I I don't know. I always like, also like to give some grace to people when English isn't their first language and they're still doing the interviews. Oh, I know Sosa's been in this yeah. country you for a long time. You have not been back in the city since 2007. You're back. You don't think you're getting that question? Well, maybe he thinks that, like time is passing. His I, representative, I, who I have books, no idea. His representative who booked him at the autograph show. And uh, I'm guessing, just guessing, that he arranged that interview and told yeah. the Fox people he's going to be there. You're going to be asked a question about steroids. Like, that's just... Again... And it was a follow-up. It wasn't even like, hey, nice for all that fluff you just gave me. I want to ask you about steroids. It was him with this very, like... Yeah, made mistakes. mistakes. Well, he acknowledged and, that he made a mistake. Yeah. You no know, statement about the mistakes that he made. And then the reporter, I don't know if he's going to bring it up, quite frankly. I think I don't know if the reporter's going to bring it up until he said, said that. Said mistakes. But and it, that's when, of course, just like when he was on Congress, that's when Sammy Sosa all of a sudden doesn't know English. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> I have no knows problem. English when he's talking about what he wants to talk about. But when you ask him about steroids, it's no habla English. Yeah, I have no problem with a reporter asking the follow-up question. Of course not. I, I that That to me is totally fine. I'm just, and it got awkward for sure. I'm just wondering why do they need, why do the Cubs owners, who are you doing this for? 
Are you doing it for the Cubs fans? Do the fans of the Cubs actually want a pound of flesh? I see Giants fans who welcome back Barry Bonds and could care less at this point. Maybe some still do, and that's fine. I just wonder who this is for. You're trying to, as EJ would say, stand on business, 10 toes down, whatever, that Sammy Sosa is going to have to apologize publicly, but I don't even think the Cubs fans necessarily want that or care. They just might want to welcome back someone who gave them a good time. Well, he was there for an autograph signing. He was right. there. Obviously, people have an interest yeah, right. in him because they were going to pay for his autograph. So it's not like he was there as guests of the Cubs sure, to go sure. to this autograph no, signing. No, no, their relationship is bad. I yeah. think because the owner wants him to admit the steroids. Let's be real. The Ricketts family, they've been terrible uh, of late. Right. They're not that to, popular. Yeah. So, like, for them to really be like, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to be the ones to stand on principle and say, no, no, Sammy Sosa, you don't belong here. You're right. No one in Chicago is asking for some kind of like they've been cheated like i, I mean i don't get that impression well, that that's why I, I wonder about this about this relationship anyway there you go there we go all right we have not gotten to Perloff's against the grain we will do that next don't move maggie and Perloff, cbs sports radio you're in a five minute break Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One 
One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. the green all right maggie we have a draft situation we have a draft trade brewing and nothing is more exciting than two things the draft and trades so minnesota makes a deal with houston to get an extra first round pick everybody assumes that they're going to package them to move up for a quarterback and i think the assumption is that it'll be jj mccarthy who minnesota is meeting with next week i say no not so fast If you're going to trade up in the first round, you're not trading up for J.J. McCarthy. You have to trade up to get in the top three. And that means either Chicago, not going to be Chicago, they're taking Caleb Williams, Washington at two, or New England at three, because J.J. McCarthy is not worth trading up for. I'm sorry, he threw 22 touchdowns last year. This is modern college football. Michigan's (laughs) not going to let him throw. Then why is he that hot a prospect? There is a lot of speculation going on. Mel Kuyper, ESPN's draft guru, said that he heard the Patriots are not that into Drake May, which means the Patriots could trade that spot. Albert Breer, who covers the Patriots and the national scene, says the Patriots are not looking to trade that spot. Mm. I think that Minnesota is going to call them. Their first call is going to be New England. They say we're going to give the number 11 pick, the number 23 pick, and next year's first rounder. And Minnesota would trade up, but they're going to have the fourth pick, of course. A lot of people, myself included, would think it's ridiculous that the New England Patriots would think they can pass on a quarterback. And you're going to pass on a quarterback when you're picking three and this, the top of this class, I know we've talked about quarterbacks being a crapshoot, but the top of this class has been very highly touted. And you've got to start some kind of rebuild. You think Robert Kraft is going to get rid of Bill Belichick, have Gerard Mayo in there so they can, what, tank? For who? Shador? I mean, I, I just don't know where that leads you. You're already picking third. It's time to reset with a quarterback because Mac Jones didn't work. I I just don't think that pick's actually for sale. However, I do think... Okay, so let's just say, for example... it could be McCarthy. I was going to say, so what happens... Let's say picks one, two, and three are not for sale, right? Yeah. What do the Vikings do then? Do they use this draft capital to get up to four? Or do you think they just stick at 11? Four or five, uh, for sure. But also, the Patriots could take McCarthy. That's also a big draft rumor out there that they like McCarthy more than May, which does make sense. May is supposedly a developmental quarterback that he's not completely polished. We'll see. He's big. Uh, I think also, too, Minnesota's got to like Drake May because he's tall, just like Kevin O'Connell. That's my one thing. Kevin O'Connell's <laughs> looks gigantic. like Kevin O'Connell. That's funny. Yeah, well, Kevin O'Connell's 6'5", May 6'5". I don't understand McCarthy. I don't understand the McCarthy thing at all. Uh, so there's a lot of lot of speculation that Arizona's for sale of four because they have needs everywhere. Of course they'll trade out of four. And the Chargers have all sorts of needs because their team's gotten so old. They'll trade out of five. So Minnesota could easily trade up there and get J.J. McCarthy. Okay, so, but that's my thing. Is J.J. McCarthy worth trading up for? Like, that's yeah. the, the premise of, of your against the grain, right? Why would you trade up just to get J.J. McCarthy when... I don't think so, but I think they will. Because I think everyone thinks that J.J. McCarthy won't get past the Giants at six. Ah, okay, right. So you're dealing with the the Giants. And the other rumor is the Giants will trade up into four or five to get McCarthy. So there's going to be a little... You know how quarterbacks are. you got to jump the team ahead of you. So This is how you make mistakes. (laughs) Cardinals and Chargers at four and five are for sale. It's going to be really interesting. Here's one just general take. It's been one, two, three... K 
Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May since January 1st. When does it ever work out that the draft works out that way? It can't be that obvious. No, and I think you're also seeing this funny thing about Marvin Harrison Jr. versus Malik Neighbors, yeah. which is also kind of interesting to me. I think they're both going to be really good, but Marvin Harrison Jr. has been the leader in the clubhouse yeah. of the first non-quarterback off the board since he debuted. Right now, all these draft analysts are saying Neighbors might be QB1. No, I mean, why receiver one? No way. It's Marvin Harrison. <laughs> Could it all be a smoke screen? I don't know. Uh, coming up, we dive back into March Madness. Jordan Cornett's calling games for Westwood One. He's going to be at the Pittsburgh Regional calling games. Get his thoughts next. Played at Notre Dame. Don't move. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining.
45 seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. She can run the 40 faster than Tom Brady. He got a perfect score on the Wonderlick. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. First four begins tonight in Dayton, Ohio, and then the madness is upon us. Hey, welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. So excited about both the men's and the women's side kicking off Perloff. And, and to help us, because I know you started filling out a bracket. Yes. But to help us get a little more in-depth and involved here, let's welcome in Jordan Cornette, who's going to be calling games for Westwood al- one alongside Scott Graham. He's going to be in Pittsburgh. Of course, Jordan, uh, great player at Notre Dame, four-year player there. All the way to the Sweet 16, I think, was the furthest you guys went and, and lost to Arizona, right? Jordan, welcome to the show. Uh, Maggie, Andrew, it's good to be on with you guys. Great time of the year. And, uh, yeah, no better way to start an interview than a reminder of a loss. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was going to bring up Duke, but I thought that'd be indelicate, so I went with Arizona. Uh, your memories of playing in the tournament, what's the one that sticks out? Uh, they're, they're, they're lasting memories. I mean, I, I'm turning 41 in a couple weeks, and, I mean, you're talking about 20-plus years ago, and I still remember – uh, both of our tournament bursts vividly. I also remember the two years we didn't do enough to make it, so it's why I probably lack a little bit of sympathy to the St. John's <laughs> providences of the world, these other teams, because you have an opportunity in the regular season to not put yourself firmly on the bubble. We're the last team left out my final mm. two years, and you got to look in the mirror. I mean, you, you got to win games that you're expected to win throughout the course of the season so as not to be put in that spot. Um, but I do remember just the finality of the tournament, um, the energy around it, how, you know, in college athletics, football is king. But during this time of the year, basketball gets its flowers, gets that stage. And it's really cool to see institutions rally around, the student body rally around their basketball programs as they, as they chase a national championship. It's really cool. But, Jordan, uh, we've been debating about the NIT and teams not going all week long. What's your take on that? Because it does, I was looking at your Twitter feed. I don't think you were a huge fan of being stuck in the NIT when you didn't make the tournament. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm listening to all these people uh, cl- uh, per- pearl clutching on my Twitter page talking about it's another opportunity to play basketball. Uh, well, I'd say to those ill-informed people, like, every opportunity is an opportunity to play basketball. Like, for those who, who, who of course, if you get the invite, I think I, I see the benefit of going to play. But just because as, as a senior, when we went to NIT, I had an opportunity to start training to go play for a career, just like everybody as they enter into the end of their senior year in college they start to prepare for a a a career in business like you turn the page like are you guys filling out your nit bracket who do you guys have in the final four which team do you guys like is everybody talking about the NIT? of course they're not it's a losers tournament now there is a benefit for certain teams there's a very niche element for teams that maybe are very young that have an opportunity to extend and keep their nucleus together and build for next year you've seen that happen but the majority The teams that thought they'd maybe be in the dance didn't quite do enough. They have zero interest in playing in that tournament. When was the last time you've gone back to a college basketball team that has not even rich in tradition, but some tradition? Do they bring out at halftime the NIT champion from 1992? Of course they do. My alma mater will. (laughs) GW will. Yeah, GW may do that, Maggie. But, like, (laughs) all in all, like, no, people don't do that. So, like, Everyone wants to sit here and get up on the, on the stage and talk about, it's an opportunity to play basketball. I get it. And I love Tom Crean. He's a close friend. But I know he would have been miserable taking a team <laughs> at Indiana into playing for the NIT because he had to do it before. And so 
I just don't like everybody putting a lot of like, oh, go play it. It's it's, it's not a tournament anybody cares about. It was, those were my worst, worst memories as a player in the NIT. Jordan Cornette is joining us. He does a fantastic job, obviously. Uh, is going to be calling games for Westwood One. He's going to be in Pittsburgh. And we'll get to some of the teams that are in that region in just a moment, Jordan. But just overall, if you could finish this sentence, if UConn loses in this tournament, it will be because why? It'll be because they run, they run into Auburn. Uh, in that second weekend, and uh, I am really taking time on my bracket to decide what I want to do with UConn and Auburn because a lot of people have obviously the prohibitive favorite, the the overall number one UConn to repeat and be the first team to do it since Florida did it in 06 07 with Al Horford, Joe Noah, and those guys. But people need to become well aware of the fact that Auburn is the lone team in college basketball that is top 10 in offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency, meaning they're the most complete and most balanced team in college basketball. Now, what's also interesting there is people might go, well, UConn's not. Well, here's UConn's metric. They are number one in offense efficiency. <laughs> they are 11th in defensive efficiency. So they're right there. These are the two most balanced teams, which is going to make for an incredible game. But it's a veteran-laden team that Bruce Pearl has. I was down there at the SEC tournament um, calling that championship game, calling their run with Westwood one. And I'm really impressed with that group. Janai Broom is as a big hybrid, big alongside Jalen Williams. They've got great guards. They play 10 guys. They get up in you with pressure and they can score in the half court. They can score in transition. I think that might be one of the best games in the tournament. If both teams are able to advance, which I expect them to as a one and a four. Jordan, I read a stat on the show yesterday that I saw on ESPN stats and info that no champion since the repeat 2007 Florida team has even made it past the sweet 16 the following year. Is this a fluke? And even when you look at Connecticut, or is this systematic that it's so hard to not only repeat, but to do well after winning a title? Well, Andrew, I think a big part of it is when you have that type of success, guys maybe make uh, knee-jerk reaction decisions and elect to go to the NBA or do other things. So in a lot of, in a lot of squads, it's, it's not necessarily rebuild mode, but it certainly isn't always the case of reload mode. And UConn is in that position where they're actually reloaded this year I mean, when you look at UConn's rotation, it's two All-Americans, it's two lottery picks, it's two guys that shoot above 42% from three. And Cam Spencer is the most efficient per possession by points of anybody in college basketball, and he's probably middle of the pack in terms of most talented in their rotation. I mean, it's crazy what Dan Hurley's built there. He's built a machine. I, I really think they've become the gold standard. Obviously, they're the reigning champion, but he's become the gold standard in saying, hey, we did it that year, but we're going to continue to push. I mean, this is a group that's poised to be great for years to come just with his approach. Everybody knows Dan Hurley's aggressive passion and how he, how he goes about things. But uh, being up here in Connecticut, living in Fairfield, it's wild to watch what he's done here and brought UConn back to uh, real prominence. Jordan Cornett is joining us, going to be calling games for Westwood One for the NCAA tournament. Of course, four years at Notre Dame playing and had a lot of success there. Okay, let's go to a team you're going to be watching front and center, and that's Kentucky. So how would you compare this Kentucky team, Jordan, to some of the other uh, great Kentucky teams we've seen? Uh, Kentucky has all the talent in the world, uh, like Kentucky's always had. I mean, they've got two guys in the center lottery picks and Rob Dillingham and Reed Shepard. They're coming off the bench. A lot of scrutiny there because they're coming off the bench. Uh, I think it speaks to, you know, Cal's stubbornness perhaps, but it's how he's elected to go about this thing. It, it's kind of perplexing because at the same time, people are wondering, uh, and coach is trying to figure out how to get these two off the better starts. Well, a lot of people would argue by starting them in college basketball games might help, but Coach Kyle's forgotten more basketball than a lot of people know, so I'm certainly not one here to second-guess him. Biggest question mark with Kentucky this year is can they guard can they guard on the perimeter? I mean, watching them in the SEC tournament, they could not keep the Aggies guards in front of them uh, at all. Wade Taylor was dominant. Tyrese Radford was dominant. Those guys are going to be the type of guys that Kentucky's going to see in this bracket. So if Kentucky is not committed to guarding on the perimeter, keeping guys in front. It could be a, a grand opening, grand closing situation for the Wildcats. That being said, they average nearly 90 points per game. They're one of the most explosive offenses They thrive at the three-point line. Reed Shepard shoots nearly 53% from three, so he can put a team on his back. But it's one of those squads where any given guy in that rotation excuse me, can go for 25 in a game and take over. So 
they're the most polarizing team in the tournament field. They could be out in the first round. They could win the national championship. Talking to college basketball analyst Jordan Cornette. So, Jordan, you said you were down at the SEC tournament. I got to ask about mm-hmm. another SEC team because I'm just I'm stymied by them. The Tennessee Volunteers, two seed, one of the biggest stars, Dalton Connect. But I don't see a lot of experts having them penciled in the Final Four. What do you make of the Vols? Well, you know, Andrew, it's really interesting, and I think that's why this tournament's going to be chaotic. Uh, once again, you're looking at a Tennessee team that is one of 21 teams in conference tournaments that were one seeds that didn't win their conference tournament. I, I believe that's the most in conference tournament history, which speaks to chaos, which speaks to uncertainty, which speaks to uh, there's not a lot of brand recognition with this Tennessee team, and I'm not quite certain why, because Dalton Connect is a top five NBA talent. Dalton Connect, I watched him versus Kentucky at the end of the regular season on senior day in Knoxville in a loss, but scored 40 points. I mean, this guy – is a guy that can put literally a team on his back and, and go win a championship. I like them. I just don't know how many others around Dalton Connect can get it done. Jordan, uh, Jordan Cornette joining us. He's going to be calling games for Westwood One, Pittsburgh Region. All right. Uh, last one for me, Jordan. Again, thank you for joining us, and we appreciate your expertise so much. Uh, give us an upset here, one that you like, one that you would pencil into your bracket, one of the, uh, the lower seeds who you think has a chance to be Cinderella. Ooh, I think it's got to be McNeese State. And McNeese State's become a sexy one. I think I don't have the bracket in front of me. I think that's a 6-11 game. A lot of people focus in on these. these and i, I got to go back and check. If I get the seating wrong, I'm it's doing a 12-5. this all five. Yep. It's okay. 12-5. It's, it's, yep. okay. so it's, it's one of the sexy 12-5 picks. And it should be. Will Wade is a guy that's won 30 games with that team this year. They are so good. And this, this is a part that matters to me. When you look at your tournament teams and you're trying to pick teams that could potentially do it upsets, this is a team that can generate offense in a variety of different ways. They can turn you over. They turn teams over about 16 turnovers per game they force. They can get up in a Gonzaga team that likes to play fast. Gonzaga plays fast. That could put them in position to maybe be susceptible to a couple of turnovers that could flip a game. This is also a team that shoots 38% from three. Will Wade's group also only takes 23s per game. That's not a ton, which means they are very selective in the shots and the quality of shot that they take. So this is a group that's well-coached. It's a group with a bunch of different guys that can fill it up. It's a group that is comfortable playing fast with a Gonzaga team that is not your granddaddy's Gonzaga squad that we've gotten used to mm. seeing over these past years. Maybe I should say your daddy's, <laughs> your daddy's Gonzaga squad. But you know what I'm getting at here. This is a matchup that bodes well for McNeese State because they are equipped to run with Gonzaga. They are equipped to put pressure on them. They can halt the transition game from Gonzaga and make them work. They can get it going from the three-point line. They're not scared. Will Wade is one of the best coaches in college basketball. Don't know how much longer he'll be at McNeese State, but they've won 30 games this year. They know how to win. Hey, Jordan, uh, just my personal advice on uh, calling Kentucky Oakland, don't be afraid to remind people that Oakland is in Michigan. That's my annual March (laughs) reminder because I always get that confused. Yeah, Greg's done a heck of a job with that group. I mean, he's been there for, what, 40 years yeah, uh, one of the all-time nice guys, the head coach there at Oakland. Uh, yeah, that that is true. They, they, I'll tell you, <laughs> as I sit here and sing the praises of Kentucky, they could be out in the first round. Of Oakland, if they do not guard, which they've proven to be a big issue with this team, they could be done. That being said, if I'm lucky enough to come back on the show in, in the tournament. We might be talking about them heading to Scottsdale to play for a national championship. You just never know. <laughs> Jordan, we've taken notes on everything you said. Oh, this yeah. is all for the cold takes. We are keeping receipts <laughs> on everything. <laughs> Nothing gets by us here on the show. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the first couple days of the tournament. Enjoy it. Uh, and we can listen to you on Westwood One with Scott Graham. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it, guys. Maggie, Andrew, good luck. Enjoy the madness. Thanks for having me on. All right. We'll thank talk you. soon. Jordan Cornette, great job. Yeah, my, my Oakland-Michigan joke sort of fell flat, but that is an annual March joke. Oh, Robert Morris is going to take on five guys himself. Oakland's not in California to Michigan. It's one of the things that you only think about in March. Am I wrong? No, I love playing a little March Madness geography game. Like <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You love that game. McNeese, I mean, I had to look it up. It's in Louisiana. I have the slightest idea. It's in Louisiana. I should have done as a trivia question. Uh, Sanford, who's, Sanford was the who big might one. play McNeese State in the next round. Alabama? We just talked about this. Birmingham, Alabama. You're right, right. Yeah, you were. Because I thought it was no, because we you actually did that last week on the show, <laughs> and I said, ah, oh, that's in Georgia. So, How many people do you think know where Wagner is? 
Why there? That's a good question. That's near us, right? That's yes. Staten, Staten Island. Island. Shao, the land of Shaolin. Wu Tang Clan strikes again. <laughs> are there any other uh, schools here that are just complete mysteries? Well, Stetson. To people? Do a lot of people oh, know where Stetson is? Oh, Stetson. I heard someone talk about uh, that. Is where they filmed uh, the Water Boy. I heard this on ESPN, but it's not in Louisiana. No, where the Water Boy was set. It's in Georgia. No, or, <laughs> Alabama. Nope. It's in Florida. Florida, okay. Yeah. And people know, the only reason why we know Stetson is because, well, we, and I mean me and EJ and Pete, why do we know Stetson? Why? Guys. Did I forget something? Jacob DeGrom? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's a Florida boy for sure. <laughs> the Texas the Ranger, whole, Jacob DeGrom? <laughs> yeah. 855. Oh, bringing back old stuff, man. Uh, no, I'm sorry. 855-212-4CBS. Greatest guest of all time, by the way. Jordan Cordette. Loves, he really loves the NIT like me. <laughs> okay, so he railed on the NIT, and Pete loved it. it. Literally got in my ear and said, this is my favorite guest of all time, because he agreed with you. However, we saw from Jordan's tweet that he played in the NIT, and for some reason they were playing one shining moment as the players were coming out on the field. That's like a tournament <laughs> trolling these guys. <laughs> Wait, That's why he doesn't like it, probably. I know. We had been talking about the NIT for too long, so I had to move it along to the uh, actual... March Madness bracket, but yes, that was a detail from his. But he was home. Was, was it a home game or a road game? It was a home game because he said he just missed the tournament. Wow! Just saying, that's what his tweet said. <laughs> yeah, the MC at Notre Dame. I hope they're doing something else. <laughs> Maybe he was joking, but that—that's what he said. Eight five five two one two four CB. <laughs> Maybe the wrong playlist or something. Um, speaking of which, our March Madness Maggie and Perloff style bracket, one hit wonders. We've already got some early results and some early upsets. We'll get that to you next. Don't move. It's Maggie Perloff, CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two 
two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. The Defensive Player of the Week is sponsored by the Navy Federal Credit Union, who proudly serves the Armed Forces, DOD, veterans, and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. I got it this week. I'm going to nail the Defensive Player of the Week, chosen by E.J. Stewart. I saw a stat yesterday that blew my mind. Second half of the season, Victor Wembanyama is averaging twice as many blocks as the second leading person on that. 4.6 per game since I might be the All-Star break, but certain period of time, Victor Wembanyama, finally Defensive Player of the Week. What I think got? he's gotten it like seven times. EJ usually switches it up. That's why I don't think it's going to be Wemby. Wen I, bust I, I think <laughs> it's going to be something from... EJ loves college basketball. You don't think he's going to do something from one of the conference tournaments that we just saw? He definitely is. This okay. is more about reading EJ than it is even about knowing sports. Which is why I love it. I feel like it's a good time to throw in Wemby. Okay, okay I have no idea. All right, so the defensive player of the week this week is Taman Lipsy of Iowa State. Thank you. He had four steals and a block in the uh, Cyclones Big 12 championship win over (laughs) Houston, a game in which Houston scored just 41 points in the loss. Those people that are nervous about Houston and their brackets, in part because they watched this performance. Taman Lipsy, an awesome point guard who also has six assists. He's the consummate floor general, but you're talking about defense. The two guards for Houston, LJ Cryer, Jamal Shedd, two stars, shot a combined three for 29 mm. in the backcourt. So uh, Lipsy was all over the place. He dominated the game from start to finish. Not a guy who needs to score a lot of points to make his impact. He showed that in the Big 12 championship game. So Taman Lipsy, my defensive player of the week. That's a good one. I, I thought it was a stretch at first, but you're right. But those Houston guards will... They'll miss shots on their own. Hey, I got one more. Where is this college game for you? Oh, I know you guys I love, love this. March Madness geography. Go ahead. Okay, you guys all might know this. So maybe it's easy. Drake. Yeah, we talked about this before. Oh, yeah, we did. We did talk about this before. Drake is. We talked about having celebrity fan Drake, but we never said where it is. Oh, I there. did. But you guys may have. No, oh. no, no. We were just talking about this. Drake is in. Ah. Uh... I don't remember you said the actual location. Sorry, no, I he re- did. EJ definitely said it, and now I can't. I, I can't conjure it. It's not Ohio. Ah. Iowa. Ah, which is why you. I'm excited because we may see a Tame and Lipsy matchup against Drake, yes. who's in Des Moines. Okay, real quick, I'll go next level. Give me the city for these colleges. I'll give you just two. If you could tell me, uh, Florida Atlantic, which city? Boca. Uh, Boca. Yeah, Boca. Boca. Okay. I actually called a game there once. South Dakota State. Anyone gets this, I'd be wildly impressed. 
Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I know any cities. Pierre? Pierre? <laughs> Gra- <laughs> no. Is that North Dakota? Grand Rapids is, is a falls? big city. In is South. Sioux Falls in South Dakota? I think Sioux Falls. No, I, I don't think so. Is yeah. that North Dakota? That's South Iowa, Dakota? isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, maybe. You could be right about that. Uh, it is in Brookings. Oh, no, Sioux Falls is South Dakota. You're right. Oh, okay. Pierre, yeah. I was right. Pierre's is in South Dakota. I could have been right, but I was... Yes, same here. Pierre's, so that's the capital. All right. Yes, we know cities in South Dakota. I just happened Hooray. to look at... I was looking... I'm like, how can I stump you guys? Because you've gotten every every college state. Could I give you a city? South Dakota State, Brookings, South Dakota, according to the website. What about Creighton? People know that one? Creighton is... Yeah, that's, that's in St. One. Louis, right? No. Uh, no, no, not St. Louis. Creighton is in... Indianapolis. No. No. Maybe that wasn't Iowa an easy City. one. No, it was no. in Nebraska. Omaha. Oh, yes. Another yep. quick Nebraska thing while we're doing this is not a geography <laughs> thing. I was stunned to realize yesterday that the Nebraska men's basketball team has never won an NCAA tournament game. Wow. They've never won. Tyron Lue went there, right? Yeah, he did. He never won. Nope. Never won. And I believe they're the only Power Five conference to game team to never win a tournament game. Yes, and I was looking up some of the history of the Nebraska men's basketball program, and guess what? Way back in the day, I'm talking like the 19-teens, they had a coach whose name was E.J. Stewart. Wow. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. According to like Wikipedia, I didn't cross-reference it. If I had been actually writing a book report on this, I would have so found I- a second source. <laughs> But EJ Stewart, according to Wikipedia, coached Nebraska men's basketball. That's pretty cool. I was watching. I was watching Wisconsin versus Illinois on Sunday, and because you know Iron Eagle kept saying AJ Store, my girlfriend walks in. She's like, "Hey, EJ Stewart." I'm like, "It's not that close." She's like, "It sounds like it." I'm like, "No, it doesn't." We still don't know EJ's middle name. Uh, that is hilarious to me. This is like a four month thing on this YouTube chat that nobody knows my middle name. I have a guess. Ooh, okay. I think it's Jay. J A Y. Oh, we oh. know it's a J. We know it like, starts like with the letter J. J? Oh. Yeah. Clever, but no. A guy named Guy? Right. Clever, but no. It's oh. not right? Oh. No. Wow. This is a good guess. I kind of like that one. I'm I looking stole at... that one from The Simpsons, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> 1994, Eric Piakowski was one of the leading scorers in the nation in Nebraska, but he couldn't get it done in the tournament. Now I'm fascinated by this. Isn't it crazy? It's a crazy anomaly. I think they've only made it like eight times. Eight I mean, or it's nine. not a great. It's not a great basketball. No, area. I know. <laughs> I mean, so I mean, it's it's. I guess it shouldn't be that surprising. I just think anyone but, in a Power Five is one right, of these. Right. At games. some point, you're gonna. You, but honestly, I think there may be there may not be a program who cares more about football and less about basketball in terms of the 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 spectrum than maybe Nebraska. Oh, we could find another one. <sighs> I don't know. They haven't won a tournament game ever. That's interesting. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. The I football and basketball while, balance is always fun. For a while, I think it was probably the opposite with Kansas. More about yeah. basketball, not about well, football that's at a good all. One. Kentucky, too. If you Kentucky reverse famously. Duke. But Kentucky's, they're, they're starting to get, no, no. get lit now with Stoops. Yeah. Now they're starting to win a little bit. Well, yeah. do you remember Stoops came out and said, now we're a football school. <laughs> and Cal Parry did well. not like that. That was, that, was <laughs> hap- that was delusion on his part. Fighting words. Uh, did we do enough? Uh, Unless you want it, this is, I mean, I could go. Longwood. I think we could save this all week. Oh, Longwood, yeah, Longwood Gardens, Philadelphia, <laughs> Pennsylvania. Nope. Did we? Did, did we talk again? about? No, I do not. No, I did not. After I butchered Creighton, which I, <laughs> I must have known at some point in my life. Sure, uh, Farmville, Virginia. Oh, Farmville. Like you? Did you know? <laughs> I that? knew a girl from Farmville. Uh, no, I did not. Uh, has Longwood ever been to the tournament? I don't remember much about them. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, like this is kind of a new one, right? We're used to all the 16 seeds like Stetson. Oh, yeah, I've heard that name before. Sanford, sure. St. Peter's, love them. But Longwood, not so much. Peter Schwartz is here with headlines. Hey, Peter. Good morning. We will start with baseball and the Giants and free agent pitcher Blake Snell have reportedly agreed on a two-year $62 million deal. The reigning National League Cy Young Award winner gets an opt-out after the first season. Now to the NBA. We'll start in Los Angeles. Hart searching. Peyton on him. Brunson gets it back. Open. Three-pointer. Pucks it in. Jalen Brunson, 26 points. And the Knicks back up by nine. My apologies. That was Mike Breen calling the Knicks-Warriors game. 
I'm always good for one of those mistakes. <laughs> the Knicks beat the Warriors 119-112. At least you're hitting your averages. Jalen, Jalen Brunson led the way with 34 points. Now to Los Angeles. Russell for three. Good again. D'Angelo Russell is up to 27 points on 8 of 13 shooting, 6 and 9 from 3. That was John Ireland with the call on Lakers Radio. Lakers over the Hawks, 136-105. D'Angelo Russell, 27 points. LeBron James, 25. And speaking of LeBron, teaming up with J.J. Redick for a podcast that will be pure conversation about basketball. In a promo for the podcast, LeBron says he would play inbounds coverage differently entirely. There's a lot of things, other things I would do in basketball, too. Like, it's a couple other coverages I would do. The... the <laughs> the pick the picker B.O.B. Not bombs over Baghdad, but baseline out of bounds. Yeah. America's play. Yeah, America's play. Yeah. LeBron also. Oh, so this is going to be like a really heady basketball podcast. And I'm assuming it's going to be simulcast too on some kind of visual aid as well. There right? was a video in this clip, but right. I don't know if that's going to be every episode. I have no Whoa. idea. Whoa. Okay, so you get some really in-depth J.J. Redick, LeBron James talking hoops. Like he's reinventing the wheel of basketball? Uh. I mean, I think this is going to be for some... I think the hoops people are really going to like this. You're going to get a little insight. I mean, I've thought about this. Yeah. You know, Tom Brady calling games. Tom Brady's got a sparkling personality, but we're doing it for the... We want to see him because of the football. I want Belichick, you know, potentially doing media, not because he's this, uh, you know, charismatic dude. It's because you want the football. To have Brady... Or excuse me, to have LeBron and J.J. Redick... Talking mm. in depth X's and O's. I think I think I think we good. underestimate for some basketball fans how disappointed and frustrated they are with basketball discourse in the on the internet and in media. Because in the NFL you have your big pie in the sky talk talking points, and then you have Amina Kimes who will break down stats left, sure, sure. right, and it's made her a megastar. I think there is a place for this. My only concern would be Will this become a thing for actual basketball fans of learning about the game, or will it be about, hey, this is why my era is better and why I'm the greatest of all time from LeBron James? Oh, and you're worried about is, an agenda. That is my concern, is yeah. that the agenda will creep in and make this something that nobody wants. My concern is the general vibe of it is very... I can't put my finger on it. There's two bottles of wine sitting there. Yeah. It just feels like, oh, so pretentious. Hmm. JJ, right? I mean, well, JJ, JJ Reddick and, and LeBron, too. <laughs> like, both of them are polarizing, just kind of know it alls a little bit. And, and we don't have a shortage of those podcasts around. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, well, well no, this we don't, is we different. Don't have, we don't have podcasts like this, Pete. I would disagree with that. I was going to say, I think the Gilbert we Arenas don't. podcast is kind of taking a different tact. You get a lot of top fives, you know, hey, who are your top five players right. of all time? And then we, you know, pick apart younger players who put Paul George in there and stuff like that. If they're really going to try to educate the fans and do it in a way that people uh, actually want to hear it, so that's educate. a thing. You just turn me off with educate the fans. <laughs> well, you know, oh. I don't want to be ba basketball the homework. I don't need education from LeBron James about basketball. Uh, just who? talk about just talk, you know what? Give me give me something that's entertaining. Talk about football. You know what? I, I don't want to hear about <laughs> yeah. you talk about basketball. Talk about football. <laughs> talk about uh, uh, the Joe Cowboys, coming out yeah. to the mound to uh, take the ball from uh, from Carlos <laughs> Rodon. Talk about talk about different stuff. Stuff you wouldn't hear them talk about. I agree with that's that. That's what I listen I, to. I think, I think Wait, you want be a LeBron mixed, talking about anything but basketball. Well, He's yeah. so good at football. You He's want a him great at football. So yeah. yes, definitely. You want well, LeBron not? James like where's Kate Middleton? Why not? Okay. Oh. But how come but wait a minute, but how come we celebrate the Manning cast for having fun but also breaking down the But this game? is some, not some, gonna be fun. No, this, it sounds like he wants to like change the way you play basketball. And I think a lot of basketball fans are not gonna like no. this. I mean I mean they, you've played what? basketball a certain way for all these years. Now granted, they've changed the rules here and there. Sometimes fouls are different. You know the way that they interpret the rules, but it sounds like he wants to like change the way. It's, it's like taking the kickoffs out of the NFL. Like how many how many things about basketball does he want to change? I think the Manning cast is entertaining, not because of the X's and O's. It's when Peyton and Eli make fun of each other, and I hope <laughs> I don't. And I hope that JJ and LeBron have fun with it, like the Mannings have. I think uh, they got, I think they got to find a mix. But I yeah. think I think I think I think I speak for a different side of the internet because I, I know where you guys are. But I the, the basketball discourse is broken. 
It's broken. You and can use the word it's part basketball discourse. It, it is, though. I mean, there's no uh, other way to say it. I mean, basketball talk, whatever. But, like, it's it's not because we we, we, have, we, have, we are unable to talk about the game without making it a top five list, without making it a, a legacy game. Oh, that's and true. There, and, there, and there are fans <laughs> who dislike that, and, right. and they're out there. It's not like I'm making up the wheel or, or making something up. So... Now, I don't know if this is the answer, the presentation. I agree with Proloff, sipping wine. LeBron's like, hey, by the way, let me give you another second glass. It's like it, it, it's a little weird, and everything LeBron does is a little weird. So I got to take the bad with the good, I think, but I'm willing to give this a shot. Well, it's not going to be for everybody, but it's not for everybody. So here's the question, though. I wonder about the basketball discourse, as you said, and it's broken, but is that the – what is it, the – Dog wagging the tail, or the what? Or you wag the dog? Like who? Who is responsible most for ring culture? It's a great question. I is think- it the players themselves, or is it the media and everything post Michael Jordan? I, I don't think that the fans are all totally to blame here well, for the basketball well, discourse being being broken. And I also I would say, is there the fans? Is there yeah. one part of that the internet is having one conversation, and the other I would say was probably who Barkley, Kenny, Shaq as the, you know, number one basketball pregame and postgame show and then whatever's going on on ESPN. Well, I think the problem is we, like, my issue as an NBA fan has been we do not have both. Is that you, and if you turn on NFL, you turn on ESPN, you can watch a, a certain show that will give you hot takes, whatever, left sure. and right, and you can get what you want, and that's fine. But I can also turn on NFL Live, and that's not just, like, a bunch of people talking about who's your top five quarterbacks. Yeah. Like, that, right. that gets a little in-depth, more in-depth than you would expect. The NBA just does not have that. And I think that that is something that is missing, and it, it does – lend itself to to the discourse that War of the Pearl of Hates becoming very, in some people's minds, toxic. Well, there's a show, ESPN Matchup, with Greg Cosell and Sal Palantonio for years on ESPN. I love that show. Yeah, but it got pushed till 7 a.m. on Saturday morning because if you're not doing the hot take NFL Live stuff, you have no chance. Right. People do not want that X's and O's. It's been proven time and time again in football. Yes, Mita dives into that, but she also does a lot of entertaining stuff. And, you know, I think you have to have a balance, like you said. Right, yeah. But, yeah. And the other thing, too, uh, about LeBron, what we'll do is we'll pull quotes from this all the time, just like Tom Brady's we'll podcast. It, right? Tom Brady's podcast, no one ever listens to that, but we play the sound all the time. I That's my sense. I've never heard anyone says, oh, God, i got to download Tom Brady. I think it's going to be similar. I don't want to hear Tom Brady talk for but an hour and a half many, about football. How many segments have we done, though, on this show where yeah. it's been Aaron Rodgers talking about, hey, Dak Prescott and the way he's doing his cadence is so interesting. Or Tom Brady saying, hey, the way this guy right. is playing quarterback. Like, that's not, we'll oh, pull that. Dak we'll... Prescott's a top two quarterback. That's a totally different thing. And my point is that yeah. for basketball, we don't have, right. we don't even care about that. But we'll pull LeBron talking about that stuff just like we pull Brady. We're just not going to listen to it because it's not going to be entertaining, I think. Uh. I, I kind I like the fact that we're gonna have access to JJ Redick is fine, but a- access to LeBron's basketball mind is something that is pretty unique. Oh. If he's gonna be, <laughs> <laughs> why is that so? <laughs> you like being spoken down to? <sighs> I don't think he's speaking LeBron's down. LeBron's basketball mind. By the way, you sat there and complained when Michael Jordan got to control the narrative of Last Dance. I, mean, I think Jordan's basketball mind was annoying enough. Oh, I didn't complain. I would if Jordan would give us a little more of the secret sauce and not the fabricated. I made up that this guy gave me a slight so that I could drop thirty on his head and embarrass him that to me though is just got stale but LeBron's IQ is is it's it's high I mean it's it's but I would would love I would love Jordan talking about actual basketball Jordan himself has leaned so far into the mythology that I I don't get basketball from Jordan I get vengeance from Jordan I just get revenge and I get I was you know I get I had the ball in my hands or I was guarding you in the last possession And, and one of the things we're seeing in this sport as well I think is different than other sports is the disconnect between how the game is played today and fans disliking it is also extremely high. Baseball has a, a similar problem as well. People don't understand why people are taking all these threes. People don't understand why there isn't more defense. And if you're going to try to, again, educate or at least present in a better way why the game is being played today the way it is, this is the way you do it. You don't do it with saying, well, again, this is my top five list or whatever. And that's fun. And, we, and I love doing it and yeah. we'll continue to do it. I'm just saying that... The, there's a there's there's the fans that want more of this, but there are also fans who hate the way the game's being played. So if you can't explain to them how the game's being played, then what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to sit there and just go out there, score your 35 points, and have people say, "Oh, look, see the guys don't play defense here." 
Like, I sat courtside next to Pearl with Pearl yeah. off, and you watch that game. I know that was one of the worst NBA games of all time, but I watched that game, and I'm like, man, the physicality wow. is totally different up close and personal. That's it's a totally different game. They changed. I mean, uh, that, now I'm seeing a lot of data. The uh, the officials decide they're not calling anything anymore. Right. Silver came out in January, so now it's a defensive game. Nobody likes that either, ironically. <laughs> Uh, all right. What do we solve here? I don't know. I, I think we're going to listen be... to LeBron's podcast with J.J. Reddick. It's just a combination of LeBron and J.J. We can't underestimate. You get LeBron and J.J. together? <laughs> I, I, we, I will listen to it because it's LeBron. I mean, he's he is very entertaining as well. But that is, that's a lot to handle. I, I, you have to acknowledge that those two personalities are quite quite uh, confident you, in their own abilities. You know, gonna, the, sorry, go ahead, you know where the NBA lost me? The NBA lost me. We talk about ring culture when LeBron went up to that school with Jim Gray. That's where the NBA lost me. And oh. the super teams came into play, and it was all about them, and it was taking over the front offices. And that's where the NBA lost me and lost the casual fan. I'm always going to be a Knicks fan, but they lost the they lost the casual fan on things like that when they turned into super teams and threes and whatnot. And that's why when you get to things like this, people turn away from it. Mm-hmm. But what you else never, we got, Pete? You're never going to watch it anyway, though. So I'm saying, if if you if you that's not true. That's not true. I sat there waiting for LeBron to make a decision, like everybody else. Uh, he was going to come to the Knicks. He was going to go somewhere else, and then we found out he was going to go to Miami. But he made it a big charade, and it was a big thing that for was sure. blown way out of proportion. Yeah, he's and never gotten over. It turned people off. He never got over. It. If he never did that, would you say, okay, now I'm gonna sit here and listen to this two-hour well, podcast? Yeah, and I'm because talking you know about what, it base, baseline out of bounds. It would have shre- We wouldn't be going down the road of super teams. That was the whole thing. It started the whole thing of super teams, and and. and and the emphasis off of the game and off of uh, two-point plays and off of actually playing, getting in the paint. That's what happened yeah. with that. I uh, We'll have to dive into that another time. That's really interesting, yeah. Any yeah. more headlines, Pete? Uh, let me run through a couple of the scores for the final time this morning. Bulls over the Blazers, 110-107. The Sixers beat the Heat, 98-91. You had the uh, Celtics over the Pistons, 119-94. The first four tonight in the uh, NCAA tournament in Dayton, Ohio. And one football note we didn't get to this morning, the Saints signing free agent defensive end Chase Young to a one-year deal yesterday, reportedly a fully guaranteed $13 million. Peter Schwartz, thank you so much. Great job this morning. Coming up, got a little Cowboys news for you. This one... Weird to say is it's sneaking under the radar just a little bit. We'll get you all the latest details next. Maggie and Pearl off CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Three minutes remaining.
two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Cowboy quickie for you. A little update. Uh, Cowboys just slightly reducing the Dak Prescott salary cap hit. Pearl off won't bore you with the details, but $5 million roster bonus converted to a signing bonus. Uh, so now it's uh, $55 million as opposed to $59 million. Yeah. So congrats. <laughs> a little, uh, Too little, too late. <laughs> too little because what's four or five million going to do when you've done nothing your entire free agency period? Now, listen, I am of the school that free agency signings are generally overrated because there's a reason players get to free agency. But the Cowboys had real deficiencies. They, they can't stop the run, and they really couldn't run the ball. They needed something here, and they have done nothing. Absolutely nothing. That's your Cowboy Quickie. <laughs> real quick. Uh, uh, do, also, do we know if they're going to extend Dak? They have an offseason to work on this. There's been real no concrete uh, indication one way or the other. No, I've seen a few people mention that this is just a positive sign that they're talking. Yeah. Because yep, yep. if you need Dak Prescott to sign off on this kind of restructure or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I guess they are talking. I think your original point is it. I think they're going to wait this out. I think the Cowboys, this is an mm -hmm. invitation. This is a non-invite for a contract extension, and they're going to let Dak play out the last year and McCarthy play out the last year. I don't, I'm not so sure. Oh, you're going. I, I'm not tech. so sure either way. I, I think it's very, very possible, but uh, his agent, Todd France does last minute deals. There, you know, there's a lot of extensions coming up that we haven't even heard. Of. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there are four or five quarterbacks. Is What do we know about the Tua deal? Trevor Lawrence, Tua. Yeah, what do we know about Trevor, Tua? So these deals, what if it becomes a domino where one guy signs, the other team say, oh, shoot, I should sign too. Uh, okay, just some quick stuff here. Our bracket challenge, still open. Come join us. Uh, our pal Nick in Texas puts together our Pearl Jam, P-E-R-L Jam. This is season three. You can find this on cbssports.com, or you can just check out our social media. You can follow the link. 
sign up. Uh, Nick does a great job. He runs our unofficial Facebook page, and we just like Nick. And uh, he started doing this bracket. We get nothing from it. It's absolutely free. We just all do it for fun. So come along and play with us. Uh, the other part is the Maggie and Perloff um, March Madness bracket of One Hit Wonders. Now, we revealed the last call region earlier today with number one seed, uh, Baby Got Back, Sir mix a <laughs> But I have some updates Big from... <laughs> I have some <laughs> updates from the weddings region from the yesterday. Region. Okay. Now, if this was an actual NCAA tournament, this would be the most memorable tournament in the history of the sport. <laughs> because not only did we have what did we have a 16 seed over a one seed, we had a 15 seed over a two seed. So the committee really bleeped the bet on this one. <laughs> yeah, I saw some complaints about uh, tainted love being a 16. I, I'm too young to understand whether that was good or bad. I'm sorry. Tainted Listen, love. Bum, bum, tainted love. It's not your fault, EJ. You did nothing wrong. Tainted love comes up with a massive 16 seed over number one seeded My Sharona, 52 percent to 47 percent. Um, this was just stunning to me. I still thought My Sharona was going to win, and then the 15 seeded Pump Up the Jam beats out second seeded Groove Is in the Heart. So. Bottom line, anything can happen in this tournament of one-hit wonders. Now, another big upset in this region, the weddings region, 11-seeded Funky Town takes out six-seeded Got to Be Real. Funky Town's iconic, right? Everyone knows it's in a million movies. I just think that one word, Funky Town, stands out. Everyone wants to go to Funky Town. Yeah. Got to Be Real is an amazing song, but the quality of song does not seem to be a huge factor here. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So uh, the other the other uh, matchups went chalk. So the Macarena beat out Rico Suave. That was a landslide. Jump Around by House of Pain beat out Bust a Move by Young MC. That was another landslide. Ice Ice Baby sneaks past Mamba number five. Whoop, there it is. Takes out Barbie World. That one was not even a contest. And then Teach Me How to Dougie. Uh, over Walk It Out, very close. That was 53 to 46%. Prediction. Yeah. The winner of the second round, Tainted Love versus Macarena, is in the final game. Mm. Wow. That is a one. And by the way, just like last year's final four on the men's side, you could easily get an eight seed advancing because it's the... The era of Cinderella. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to one-hit wonders from 25 years ago. Uh, so there you go. You are welcome to vote on all of these. Again, we just released the second region, the last call region. So you have plenty of time to go vote uh, at Maggie and Pearl on Twitter. As I you would not underestimate Jump Around. I think we are on in Wisconsin. And, of course, that has essentially become the uh, oh, Wisconsin yeah. anthem because what they do at Camp Randall with the fourth quarter beginning so I thought that'd be a much closer match between bust a move and jump, jump around, and it wasn't. So I would be, I'd be wary. I Taint the Love and Mac Rain are, are juggernauts as yeah. we see now, but I, I'm I'm concerned about that matchup because of our Wisconsin contingent. I think it's a wedding bracket. Weddings have kept Macarena. Weddings and any kind of Sweet Sixteens, yeah. Bar Mitzvahs. <laughs> Macarena <laughs> is a staple. So I, I think just the fact that most people can do the Macarena is going to help it a little bit in that. Do you, think, do you think they still play it as much? Now? Oh yeah, I've done I, it. I've, I've, I've done I've, it at least five really? times in the last five years. Yes. Oh, really. Wow. Uh, I was on a cruise ship last summer, as I talked about. The cruise ship had dan family dance night, and of course they're going to play Macarena, right? <laughs> right? If you're five years old, you know how to do the Macarena. I went to like a million weddings last year. I'm trying to remember. I don't know. If That's I probably to, way I'm cooler. Sure I to one that, that had one. You probably went to pretty hipster cool weddings, I have uh, to imagine. Maybe, yeah, a little bit. Some of them, not all of them. Be on a cruise ship with a bunch of 78-year-olds, <laughs> and Macarena's getting played. Cruising through Eastern <laughs> Europe. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and hands up. Hands up playing, too. Funky Town will definitely, you know, I, I think I think being played at events is big. Ice Ice Baby is going to be a juggernaut. Ice Ice Baby versus Jump Around, that is a heavyweight battle. That's good. Yeah. I'm telling you, I, this was a, this is, you know, murderer's row of a region. I thought the last call region, as we said, headlined by uh, Baby Got Back. Some oh, this is a good one, too. I think they're all murderers, bro. Some other really big ones that you can go and vote right now again at Maggie and Pearl on Twitter. Uh, Return of the Mac is a three seed here. Hey, Mickey is a nine seed. Yeah, going. At, what's Hey, Mickey going against? Kung Fu fighting. Yeah, I mean, geez. It's a matchup of the uh, tournament, probably. Who let yeah. the dogs out? Who? When I tell you Pearloff was lobbying for this to be a one seed. 
I think well, it, there was a lot of arguments at the committee about your the original seating that Maggie had for who let the dogs out. <laughs> yeah, I just because you don't. Had them very low. <laughs> listen, we none of us want to hear who let the dogs out. The second we play it, it's stuck in your head for a But you cannot. <laughs> can't deny its power, though, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> we could probably get the Baja men in studio to play it for us at a certain point. Yeah. Can't host an hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other big ones in the uh, in the the last call region. Um, Just a friend by Biz Marquis. I thought eight six seven five three zero nine has been around for a long time, and then come on Eileen, which is very popular. Kind of an wonder. iconic one hit wonder. Yeah. yeah, this this definitely. This is strong. You don't like to see any team go home. <laughs> but they'll come the back. The, of the are we going to do a one shining moment for this? Well, is one shining moment a one hit wonder? <laughs> <laughs> no, Luther Vandross had a lot of hits. That's not right. Um, thank you, EJ Stewart. Thank you to Pete Pilati. We'll have a whole new bracket tomorrow. What do we say we're doing tomorrow? Cruising? Cruising. Cruising bracket is tomorrow. Cruising Songs, region. by the way, just so we're clear about that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so this show is going to take a weird turn. Uh, thank you to Peter Schwartz. Thank you to Andrew Kaplan. Thank you to Jordan Cornette, who joined us. It was fantastic. The Weedos, the coffee drinkers. Oh, boy. Tomorrow, more one-hit wonders. Right Stay there. hard. You're in a five-minute break.